they really need it rather than continually dumping into the facilities that are 100% federally funded. And Clay Chop, for the record, to really respond to uh, to, to finalize your, your second question, Ward, uh, the interim should uh, be reduced uh, as we have this additional state money uh, to, to match up with the federal dollars. So yes, the interim, there should be a reduction in the number of interim uh, or, you know, agency agreements that we're doing. Ward Patrick, for the record, that's all good news. Thanks, thanks for that update. All right, we'll uh, advance then. We'll go to our next, our next project, our next program. All right, so this is this is uh, project number two one one four eight, and uh, the University of Nevada Reno has a a facility up near the Stead Airport that is being currently leased by the Navy Reserves. The Navy Reserves are in the process of moving their operation to Fallon Naval Air Station, and um, it's. Just as you enter that 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 site, it's off to the right hand side as you enter the gate there. So they're they're looking at potentially by the end of this year moving that, that facility. Um, so that facility, did David Paxton again. Uh, that facility uh, had about a year and a half ago or two years ago, the university went out and, and did an appraisal on that facility and found out its value to be about three point one million dollars. Um, the expectation is that that's gone up a little bit. Um, so. Uh, the guard is asking the state for 3.5 million. Uh, using this is 100% state funded. Is the, the we cannot we as a as a proponents for the, the federal entities we, we cannot spend federal funds on land. The land has to be provided by the by the state, and so that's one of the reasons we're looking. We're hoping the state can help us out with this one. Um, and this also when you combine this facility with with our number one, which is the addition to the Washington County Armory. Uh, we're still deficit readiness center space, but we're in a position where we wouldn't be asking for more readiness center space for about 10 to 15 years. So this would this would kind of help us get the ship right, so to speak. And this is uh, Clayton Chapel for the record. Uh, we are also we're working with state lands, and they're they're the ones kind of negotiating with us. Um, Charlie Donahue and, and his staff are, are negotiating with the university, and and uh, we're we're working with the Navy Reserve. Navy Reserves are just trying to get the, uh, the environmental documentation done and, and to move this project forward so we can we can purchase it and uh, start doing more training out there in the state area. Subject to questions. This is David Paxton. Just one more comment on this. Uh, the initial purchase of this facility would be 100% state, but after that, any any renovations or things like that, we'd be able to put federal money. To this is a member hand for the record I, i'm curious i'm in following along the numbers in the in the book and among the numbers in the summary aren't consistent with the slide um and i don't know why but it's, uh, i'm curious just to make sure we we don't have our wires crossed here <laughs> yeah ward patrick for the record so there have been some inconsistencies throughout throughout these but this one is a rather large one, and so you you, you know I uh, apologize to the board, but there is some production time that goes into uh, printing and getting these out, and uh, and we are publishing this a volume, you know, so there's a lot of volume here, and so we've had uh, our normal meetings at the beginning of August with all the departments presenting, and we've had follow-up meetings with the guard to keep clarifying and so there has been a significant clarifying since early August and that there's going to need to be more and so uh, that's a great point and this was the one that I was uh, specifically was aware of that there were going to be differences and so we'll uh, uh, work on those together before the September 16th uh, administrator's recommendation thank you thank you No further questions. We'll go to our project number eight. Did you skip on that? There we go.
Sorry, can you go back one slide, please? There we go. That's it. Uh, Chavis, for the record, um, we're looking at the HVAC system renovation at the Carlin Revenue Center, number 7608. With this facility, we're looking to replace the existing heat pumps and rooftop units. Uh, nearing the end of their useful life, they contain some refrigerant that is becoming increasingly hard to come by, so naturally the parts that go with that are also getting scarce and expensive. So, I do this project will improve the energy efficiency of the, of the facility. Um, yeah. Project is 2.2 million at a 54 44 split. The rest of the state was 760,000. Any other questions? Project number 21131 is the restroom and shower renovation. So again, this, is, this ties back into our number one project, uh, but uh, we're asking the state for, for some funding on this one to get this thing done before, uh, on the existing portion of that facility before we uh, add any addition to, to that. This is a... Uh, I uh, chat news for the record. The restroom and shower renovation at Washington County Armory, number 21131. We're looking to renovate the restrooms and showers because, as we discussed before, this particular facility was built for a certain number of units, and we may have tripled that number of units in there. So, naturally, there's going to be more deterioration earlier than should be. Deteriorating grout and fail drainage systems have caused some water damage. Um, they're they're due for an upgrade. Uh, the project will be uh, 1.2 million at a 50-50 split, and we're asking the state for 700,000. I apologize for not having a picture, but you don't really want to see what it looks like right now. <laughs> All right. No questions. Go on to the next one. All right, Chad Reese for the record. Um, construct storage buildings, three storage buildings. Uh, for the Nevada National Guard State Maintenance, both north and south, number 21129. Um, at most of our sites, we kind of have to carve out a spot for state maintenance for all of their equipment, and there's a significant amount of equipment between snow removal, construction equipment, you, you know, bobcat equipment, you, you name it, they, they've got it. And currently, there are absolutely no facilities to store that equipment, which obviously leads to deterioration and early replacement at high cost, because none of it's cheap. Um, we're looking at putting one here in, here in Carson City at our uh, OTAC building, one at Harry Retraining Center up in Stead, and one at North Las Vegas on the Floyd Edison Training Center down in Las Vegas. Um, the project would be 1.7 million, and we're asking for 100% state and 1.7 million for the state. Any your questions? All right, the last three, yes, we're on the last three projects that we have. They're all out of Carlin and um, right. Chad Reese for the record. Um, we're looking at a security defense edition at the Elko County Ready Center Complex. Um, if you can see in the picture, we have a we have a nice gate, a nice two wall on either side of the gate, up to the left there. Well, the rest of it is three span three span barbed wire, and in the recent past, there was an individual that broke in and kind of tore up the place a little bit. And he didn't, he didn't really have a hard time getting into the complex itself. And you can probably see why. Um, the whole project will be 1.4 million at a 56-44 split, and we're asking the state for 640,000. Um, this, this security fence will also be a huge upgrade for the Battleborn e Challenge program. Um, here in the near future, we're going to have quite a few young adults there trying to 
ran their lives. And um, the security fence is more about keeping people out, not keeping them in because they're there. They're attending by their own accord. They're not being forced to do that. So we want to keep other people out that might cause a little damage in there. So this is a pretty important one. Any new questions? Last for next one. Project uh, number 22. Chad Reese, for the record, we got a recondition of the water tank at the Uncle County Veterans Center. Uh, number 7595. Once again, this one is directly going to affect the Battleborn U Challenge. Uh, this water tank was built when the facility was new. Um, it has, hasn't had significant service since it was built, but now that U Challenge is coming in, it really needs to be, you know, inspected, reconditioned for the safety of all the kids that are going to be out there. Uh, the project is 600000 and 5644 split and we're asking the state for 270,000. Any of us? So, questions going to our last project, project number 23 that the Office of the Military has with the National Guard, and it is? This is the uh, Chad Reese for the record. Uh, replace the domestic hot water heaters within the Elko County Veterans Center complex. The existing hot water heaters are more than 20 years old, so naturally they're ending the, their useful life. And they're about to get, again, the Battle Board U Challenge, they're about to get a significant pump in use, which could cause some immediate problems once that opens, and they're being used a lot more than they are now. Uh, it will improve the energy efficiency to the whole facility because Obviously, 20 year old water heaters are not efficient at all. So, before the bottom falls out, we'd like to get those replaced. Uh, this project is 1.02 million at a 56.44 split, and we're asking the state for 470,000. Any of your questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to point out that I was there before these buildings were there. <laughs> During construction, uh, we we're on the site, just so everybody's aware. Also, I was I wanted to uh, visit a little bit about the over just the overall funding of this ask. So there's 23 projects on this ask with the current estimating philosophy that is uh, planned to be subject to change. And so the, the current summary is 17.5 million of other funding and 14.8 of state funding. And removing the two Milcon project asks, as they're stated here, uh, from, from the other funding leaves about $12 million of federal funding uh, required to complete the whole list. And so the, the question is, uh, is there a lost opportunity? You know, is this is this money lost to the state of Nevada if it all wasn't uh, approved or taken? That question is more to the, the guard. You're asking? Yes, please. Is this a last opportunity? So. You know, so if the guards are able to get six to eight million dollars a year, and if the board recommends to the governor ten of this, does that uh, disable the opportunity for that funding? Or this is David Paxton to at least initiate the answer to that question. Uh, a little bit of warm and fuzzies. We already have two million of that federal money that you're the 14 million that you're discussing because the LBRC or parking has already been funded. So we're down to 12, and, and I do feel very confident that it is not. It is very reasonable to expect that the, the guards should be able to bring six million dollars at least every every fiscal year uh, between now and the end of this biennium. And I have a follow-up comment. I know we're extended our one hour, but uh, 
I was wondering if uh, two-wheel bicycle to engage in our uh, bike to work week challenge. I do, Ward, and it is on. Uh, sorry, for the record, this is David Paxton, and uh, yes, challenge accepted. <laughs> Thank you. Member Hand for the record. Uh, thank you for your presentation, gentlemen. We appreciate it. Good job. And, and uh, uh, we uh, were pretty close to on time, even though we were we snuck in the door at the last minute. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate the time. As I said, Major General Barry, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today um, because of his schedule, but he, he does appreciate the, what Ward and his staff, uh, we, we do as well, Ward and his staff have done to, to be able to get to this point and uh, present the, the projects that are, that are very important to us as an organization. So thank you. How do we hit off? <laughs> <laughs> Services up next. They're ready to go. They're ready, They're ready to go. go. Okay, yeah. great. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Hassett. I'm Deputy Director over Administrative Services for the Department of Health and Human Services. By way of introduction, I wanted to talk a little bit about our mission and about the five divisions we have in the department, and then I'll talk to you about the three that are going to be before you today. The Department of Health and Human Services promotes the health and well-being of Nevadans through the delivery or facilitation of essential services to ensure families are strengthened, public health is protected, and individuals achieve their highest level of self-sufficiency. The five divisions that we have in our department, Aging and Disability Services Division, Division of Child and Family Services, Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy, Division of Public and Behavioral Health, Division of Welfare and Supportive Services. Excuse me, Deborah, for a second, Ward Patrick. Uh, You're supposed to. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we are capable of putting up your presentation, but right now we see uh, faces instead of PowerPoint. And so yeah. we could do that. We could uh, just put that on here momentarily to aid you in your presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep. Just a minute, we'll get it right up. Yep. Okay. Would you like us to do it or? I mean, we could do it too. <laughs> we're, we're already putting it up. I think it's loaded. Okay, yep. thank you. It takes a minute for a, a big but justified ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assured that we upgraded some of our equipment only days ago to uh, enable the speed that we are uh, enjoying now. Thank you. So, do I, would you, do I advance it to the next slide or do I just say next? I'll advance it. Just let me say, just say next. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Today there are three divisions presenting CIPs for your consideration. Number one, Debbie Reynolds, Deputy Administrator, Division of Public and Behavioral Health, or DPBH, will be speaking to you first. DPBH operates the state civil and forensic mental health hospitals. 
Deany Townsend and Links Crossing in Reno, Ross O'Neill and Stein in Las Vegas. Secondly will be Ross Armstrong, Administrator of the Division of Child and Family Services, also known as DCFS. DCFS provides children, children's mental health services on the campuses of Northern Nevada Child and Adolescent Services in Reno, Southern Nevada Child and Adolescent Services in Las Vegas, and also operates the three juvenile services facilities. One is Nevada Youth Training Center in Elko, Caliente Youth Center in Caliente, and Summit View Youth Center in Las Vegas. The third presenter will be Jeff Haig with the Division of Aging and Disability Services Division, or ADSD. ADSD operates two regional centers for intellectual and or developmental abilities. Desert Regional Center serves the greater Las Vegas area and Clark County, with the exception of a few rural areas in the south. Sierra Regional Center serves all of Washoe County. So for your first um, presentation, I'm going to just have Debbie Reynolds come up and talk to you about DPBH's requests. Thank you. Next slide, please. Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Reynolds. I'm the Deputy Administrator of Administrative Services for the Division of Public and Behavioral Health. Um, beginning with slides four and five or Project 19624, this is Ross and Neal Hospital Security Upgrades for DPOD. I wanted to start by giving a brief overview of forensic services and then I'll talk about the project. Stein Forensic Facility and Lakes Crossing Center provide treatment and evaluation services to mentally disordered criminal offenders whom there is doubt regarding their competency to proceed with adjudication. The facilities also treat clients determined not guilty by reason of insanity and unrestorable clients who are too dangerous to commit to a civil psychiatric hospital. Both hospitals currently operate under the Burnside Consent Decree, which is the result of a lawsuit filed by attorneys in Clark County. The state's two forensic facilities work together to ensure the state of Nevada and the Division of Public and Behavioral Health operate in compliance with the consent decree. The consent decree imposes strict timelines for offering and filling beds. From the day an order is received for new commitments, we have seven days to offer a bed. This leaves little to no room for flexibility if our facilities are at or near capacity. This project includes the design and remodel of the, of the DPOT unit at the Ross and Neal Psychiatric Hospital, including 20 bedrooms and four restrooms to meet forensic facility security standards. This includes a remodel of courtyard fencing, casework, light fixtures, seating, window glazing, additional sally port doors and card access, a drone protection barrier, repairs to damage finishes, and installing anti-ligature equipment. Retrofitting DPOD at Ross and Neal Hospital will support capacity issues at both Lakes Crossing and Stein Forensic Hospital. This will ensure long-term clients who are committed up to 10 years from Clark County have appropriate space in their county of residence for their special programming and long-term care needs. This unit will allow for 10 long-term high security beds at Lakes Crossing to become available and allow for better management of length of stay at Lakes Crossing and Stein in order to maintain compliance with the current consent decree. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of the nursing station at DPON. Um, that's the end of my overview for this project. Also with me today is Lisa Sherrick, our administrator, and also on the line is Dr. Elizabeth Neighbors, our forensic director, if there are any questions. Mr. Chair, this is Laura Green. May I ask a question? Yes, please do. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm sorry, would you, Debbie, can you please define casework for me? I don't know what that means. Yeah, casework is um, bookshelves. Oh, <laughs> okay. And uh, a drone <coughs> protection barrier. Do, do you guys have drones flying over Ross and Neil a lot? 
So it can present a security risk if, if a drone flies in because it, we're wanting to harden the unit to become a forensic unit. Right, and right. So if, some, if somebody were to fly something in, and it could be used as a weapon or, you know, so there does have to be a cover above, okay. not a fencing cover really above that um, gate. Okay, gate. Um, got it. And finally, um, so how overcrowded are Lakes Crossing and Stein Hospital now that we need to harden Depot to take some of that pressure off? So the um, Stein includes 78 legislatively approved beds. Okay. The current census is 46. Um, as of Friday, though, statewide, 117 of 164 beds Okay. Uh, that was 78 at Stein and 86 at Lakes were filled statewide. That's 71% okay. filled capacity. Okay. And so I just want to state while that's low, um, significantly low census for forensic hospitals, space is impacted by the need to quarantine patients due to COVID. Okay. Uh, which may require closing wings or units. Uh -huh. In the last few weeks, there has been an, up an uptick in um, an increase for court referrals. The last docket in the South produced 13 referrals, which is double the number referred the week prior um, in the last several weeks. And if this continues, uh, along with the quarantine mandate, the space in the facilities could be at a premium. Okay. What do you guys think is contributing to that uptick in referral? Um, I would have to turn that over to Dr. Neighbors. Okay. I mean, it's. Uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm more asking for, uh, for my own curiosity in terms of um, is this like a COVID-driven situation, or is this, or, or is there really stress on our currently hardened facilities such that we need to harden a, a, a pot of a raw steel? But I will yield to the other members of the board. Thank you. Are there other questions yeah. from board members? Hearing none, we can proceed. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Slides six and seven are project 7367B, which is the NAMS boiler plant renovations. This project will replace three existing outdoor boilers located on the NAMS campus to heat buildings one, two, and five. These buildings house staff that provide direct client services. Building one is occupied by assistant outpatient treatment mental health court, service coordination, and division physical and IT staff. Building two is occupied by a nonprofit organization serving youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Building five is occupied by the medication clinic staff. The three existing boilers were installed in 2008 when the heat plant was shut down as a temporary solution to heat the buildings. The temporary boilers have been serving as a permanent heating system since then. The boilers have exceeded their useful life and should be replaced. If the existing boilers fail, it could result in the inability to provide direct client services in these buildings during the winter. And I would just note that um, in January 2020, the boiler in Building 1 did receive emergency temporary repairs. This included a temporary boiler. Um, the existing piping was replaced and it was connected to the existing temperature control system. But again, that is only a temporary solution. Uh, it's my understanding that temporary boilers of useful life is only five to ten years compared to a permanent solution boiler, which is 15 to 20 years. Uh, next slide. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Ward Patrick, for the record, uh, would you um, elaborate on the use of the buildings just briefly, item uh, buildings one, two, and five? Um, yeah, so I mean, I'll, I did mention so building one has um, outpatient treatment services, mental health court, service coordination. I would ask Lisa Sherrick, our administrator, to elaborate, elaborate on those services. Good afternoon, Lisa Sherrick, administrator for the Division of Public and Behavioral Health. So as um, Ms. Reynolds indicated, out of uh, Building 1, there is our outpatient services, which includes assisted outpatient treatment, which is a program that works with the courts for individuals that 
require um, uh, additional intensive services to remain in the community. Uh, we also have mental health court, which is another court uh, assist, uh, program. And we have our service coordination programs and therapies. So we do have a lot of individuals that will come to that building to meet with their staff, um, as well as our service coordinators and fiscal staff and administrative staff um, perform their duties at that location. It, I don't know if someone's trying to ask a question or if that's feedback. Um, in building five is our medication clinic, and that is where individuals will come and meet with um, their psychiatrist or nursing staff for nurse evaluations, um, medication supports, um, and any assessments for referrals to the community. So that is a, a critical building to the community where we do have vulnerable people traveling to that location to get their necessary assessments and treatment. And then building two, as indicated, that is being used by um, a community partner that provides um, various uh, child, child care, child programming services to uh, individuals that have intellectual disabilities, perhaps autism, um, as well as developmental disabilities. And I don't know if that answered your question enough. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Good afternoon, Ross Armstrong, Administrator for the Division of Child and Family Services. Um, and just a little bit of background before I talk about um, the next project. As we worked to rank our CIPs throughout the department, the three administrators got together and we really took a lens of um, what is the risk if the project that we're trying to improve fails, um, if there are substantial health and safety concerns, uh, if there are licensing concerns, if we're a licensed facility and if, if this fails, could we lose our license? And then the availability of alternatives. And so in terms of DCFS projects, the Desert Willow Treatment Center, uh, air, air handling units um, ranked highest because there's no real alternative. If Desert Willow Treatment Center goes down, there's not another um, you know, state-operated children's hospital that we can transfer those, those patients to. So Desert Willow Treatment Center um, is our state-operated children's mental and behavioral health hospital. Um, it serves our most, um, the youth with the, the largest challenges in terms of behavioral and mental health. Um, we'll hear about some other facilities later on that are, are a little bit lower level of care, but um, these are the most um, extreme cases in which they need the most uh, intensive care. And so uh, this project replaces the air handling units and the um, fan coils to allow for um, appropriate HVAC system um, to keep the facility operating there in Southern Nevada. Uh, we are, it is a licensed facility um, and it has joint commission accreditation. Uh, both of those would be at risk if, if we are unable to provide um, appropriate HVAC systems. I'm happy to answer any questions about Desert Below. Are there any questions? Okay, I'll toss it back over to DPB. And 11. For Project 21048, this is Lakes Crossing Center anti-ligature fixture upgrade. Lakes Crossing is an 86-bed forensic mental health hospital. The facility was constructed in 1974 with the pony half walls inside the client rooms, which you can see on the second on the next slide. These walls are a ligature risk to clients and create a challenge for the staff to monitor the clients. By removing the walls, it reduces the ligature risk to the clients and it increases the vis visibility for the staff to monitor. This project will provide a complete upgrade for the clients' rooms at Lakes Crossing Center. Okay. 
And with that, are there any questions? So I've been mentioned in the last 12 months, there has been one completed suicide and one suicide attempt resulting in the person being intimidated. Does the parents have any other questions? Okay, so then slide, tw slide 12. Is project 7370, Deeney Townsend Central Plant and Control System Renovation. Deeney Townsend is a 30-bed inpatient psychiatric hospital. This project will replace the existing boiler system and digital control system serving the hospital. The boiler was installed in 2000 when the hospital was built and is almost 20 years old. It's had several failures in the past. It's vital to the, operation of, to the operations of the hospital in order to heat the building. The digital control system is a computerized system for monitoring building temperature. It's more than 16 years old. It's antiquated, no longer available, and repairs require an upgraded hardware. Um, NAMS is certified by CMS, licensed by the state, and accredited by Joint Commission. A life safety code violation could result if the system fails and is unable to be repaired or replaced timely. Are there any questions? And there doesn't appear to be any questions. Okay, so slides 19 and 20. Oh, it's DCFS. I apologize. <laughs> okay, Ross Armstrong again. Uh, project, our department right number six on page 15 is for plumbing replacements. Uh, building seven serves for outpatient uh, children's clinical mental health services, care coordination, so um, families and children um, who need assistance are in and out of the building uh, all the time. Uh, the plumbing dates back to when it opened in 1974. So if the plumbing fails, um, not only do we have you know, no, no water for the bathrooms and sinks, but it would also make the HVAC system uh, inoperable. Um, and so that is what uh, we have there at Building 7 and the need for um, the replacement of the plumbing and piping systems. I think we recently did Building 8 on the same campus. It's just that campus um, has some you know, older infrastructure that it's getting, um, it's getting necessary to replace. And there's pictures on slide 16. If there are no questions about Building 7, I'll move on to the Adolescent Treatment Center. Our Adolescent Treatment Center is in northern Nevada um, on the NAMS campus. Earlier this year, we had a boiler failure, a boiler failure at this um, facility which houses um, adolescents. It's a little bit a uh, step below in terms of the intensity of care for those youth that uh, are at Desert Willow Treatment Center. Uh, and you know, this is what really that boiler failure at, at ATC is what made us take a look at how we ranked our CIPs in terms of what do we do if an entire building goes down. And so uh, we had to get a, a massive disruption in service for those children. They were temporarily at another building and then uh, moved to a location closer to UNR, uh, a substantial reduction in our ability to serve kids needing a placement uh, and treatment. And so um, this. This project would replace the air handling unit um, to maintain appropriate uh, climate control in the in the residential area. So, ATC includes a residential uh, building that is Building 8A. Uh, they go to Building 8N for school um, and counseling and some other items. So, um, 8A is actually where they they live. Um, it's a 24-hour care facility. So, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about ATC. Um, and this facility did recently uh, receive licensure through the Bureau of Healthcare Quality and Compliance and CARF accreditation, which would be at risk uh, if the project were, um, if the system, the air handling system would go down. And the picture on 18, that's a, an exterior picture of, of the living building for ATC. And if there are no questions, I'll toss it back to Debbie.
Okay, slides 19 and 20. Our project 7442, this is Ross and Neal Psychiatric Hospital Patient Restroom re Renovations. Ross and Neal is an 88 bed inpatient psychiatric hospital. This project will renovate 14 patient restrooms at the Ross and Neal Hospital with anti ligature lighting, stainless steel toilets, stainless steel sinks, place the ceiling in sun showers, and replace the wood lockers and plumbing shrouds. Um, it's imperative that the patient areas be um, improved with tamper resistant and anti ligature fixtures to prevent personal injury or suicide. And if there's no questions, I can move on to the next project. Beginning on slide 21. This is project 7372, Dean Townsend Psychiatric Hospital Central Plant Renovation. This project includes the renovation of the existing chiller system for Dean Townsend Hospital. The equipment is original to the building and is now almost 20 years old. It's had several failures in the past and emergency repairs have, required, have been required more than four times this year. Hospital cannot operate in extreme temperature conditions and the pharmacy medications are subject to tight temperature regulations. There are federal and state regulations surrounding medication temperatures. If the hospital is found to be out of compliance, this could result in a statement of deficiencies, including possible immediate jeopardy. If medications are not kept in required temperatures, this could also result in patients not receiving their necessary medication and therapeutic treatment during their hospital stay that could impact length of stay, patient health and well-being, and could exacerbate symptoms. And if there's no questions, I'll turn it back to Russ. So hey, Project 21272 is at Caliani Youth Center. That is our largest juvenile justice facility out in Caliani. It's our only facility that serves both young men and uh, young women. This project was approved last round um, and then was uh, swept and discontinued as part of the budgetary reduction. So um, they were all excited thinking they were getting a new gym floor and then um, that didn't occur. So um, as you can see, to the best of our knowledge, it's the same floor that uh, was installed in 1966 um, and the dining area floors also are in um, quite disrepair. So uh, the gym is of particular concern. State law requires uh, that all the youth receive um, at least an hour of large muscle exercise a day. We try to keep them um, then that in um, for them and, and during the winter months the outdoor recreation options are are limited and so um, this process would this project would replace those floors making the gym safer um, for the young people to use uh, as well as the dining area um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions about Caliente uh, or this project. Ward Patrick for the record is the gym uh, has the gym been closed off from use or have there been any reported injuries? Uh, they do have uh, occasional injuries I can get you a, a, a most up-to-date list it is not completely closed off from use because they have to have um, some of that large muscle exercise, um, but some of the more uh, vigorous activities, uh, such as basketball and those types of things, are, are it's pretty dicey when they do it. Thank you. Uh, Department Rank 11, uh, Project 21147, uh, is for the Desert Willow Treatment Center. Uh, and it's to put barriers in at the um, different um, stations. So it doesn't really set up where you have living area and there's a common area and there there's a nursing station and a front desk. Um, and I always like to think about like when you were in high school, they were teaching you like what a preposition is and anything a mouse can do to a matchbox. Um, anything anything uh, one of our desert willow patients can do to uh, an unprotected nursing station they do they climb on top they climb over they can get access to you know medications and and sharp objects uh, you can see the um, chunks of the station there that are, are peeled off that they can use either to um, create a weapon to hurt themselves or um, or others uh, the youth there um, it's not uncommon for them to have suicidal or homicidal ideations 
Um, and then occasionally we'll, you know, they'll take stuff and they'll eat or swallow stuff they're not supposed to be um, consuming. And so it is a, a high priority project for us in terms of um, the safety of the youth we're serving at Desert Willow Treatment Center. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that project. Slides 27 and 28 are project 7441, SNAMS Building 4 HVAC Systems Renovation. This project will replace the makeup air unit and other HVAC units on Building 4, which houses the kitchen at the SNAMS campus in Las Vegas. Existing equipment is approximately 15 years old and at the end of its useful life. New equipment will provide for better energy efficiency and reliability. And if there are no questions, it is Jeff, it will be at Jeff Haig with uh, Aging and yes. Aging Services. Debbie, this is Ward. Could you uh, remind us the use of Building 4, please? Uh, yeah, Building 4 houses the kitchen at the SNAMS campus. And so that provides um, food services for the campus. Thank you very much. All right, good afternoon, members of the board. Jeff Haig, Deputy Administrator of Administrative Services for Aging and Disability Services. Uh, on slide 29 is project 21125, which is a chiller replacement for Desert Regional Center Building 1391. So this building serves as the administrative building uh, for the intermediate, intermediate care facility um, on campus. It houses roughly 40 employees uh, the chiller currently in place is uh, roughly 20 years old. Uh, it was out of service as recently as July of this year. Uh, and as all of you can imagine, uh, no air conditioning in Las Vegas is pretty rough. Um, the equipment currently contains R22 refrigerant, which I understand is no longer available. Uh, with that, happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, I'll turn it over to Ross. Uh, the, for the next project, we are back at Desert Willow Treatment Center, um, and it is to replace bathroom finishes, shower enclosures, lights, exhaust fans, toilets, and plumbing um, in the bathroom areas. Uh, as was mentioned um, by DPBH, uh, the bathroom areas can be a danger zone in terms of um, suicide. I believe our last completed suicide at Desert Willow occurred in, in the bathroom, and so, um, and we did receive a, a authorization last session to expand the number of beds which is great we have more kids being treated um, but we need to um, put in you can see there that's what the anti-ligature um, different fixtures uh, look like to minimize that risk of uh, uh, attempted or completed suicide happy to answer any questions about that project i think it's back to debbie Okay. Slides 32 and 33, project 7438 is assigned hospital door replacement. This project will replace a majority, a majority of the doors and hardware and upgrade door control systems in building three, which is Stein Forensic Hospital. Building three was constructed in 1988. The interior and exterior doors are deteriorating and require replacement to prevent elopement of patients under court commitment and ensure patient and staff and community safety. Um, I would just note that not all the doors need to be replaced. Some of the steel doors are acceptable to continue using. And if there's no questions. I have a question. Okay. This is for the record. Um, and, and maybe this is, this, I remember when we were contemplating hardening Stein Hospital. And can the public works board staff remind me why door replacement wasn't in the project scope back then? Ward Patrick, for the record, I would have to uh, uh, 
get back to you on that. I would okay. assume I would assume that it was because the doors were considered uh, uh, in decent shape at the time. Okay, and so in the intervening four years of hard use, they've just gone downhill, I assume. That's correct. Next up is Ross. The project on slides 34 and 35 um, include installing wall protection in the dorm hallways and the day rooms at Desert Willow Treatment Center. Um, and so uh, you can really see on slide 35 the, the pictures of the destruction that can occur to the walls. We've had the ability to put in um, some re, you know, reinforcements and protective barriers, which do great. Um, a lot of our, our patients will act out physically um, as they're struggling with their behavioral health challenges. And so um, obviously installing these barriers in dorm hallways and the day rooms uh, reduce then the costs of replacing walls over and over again. And so I'm happy to take any questions about this project. Ward Patrick, for, for the record, on the Desert Willow Treatment Center, I was curious, uh, during construction, I believe the drywall had a, a plastic barrier on the inside of the drywall to prevent uh, you know, penetration damage. And I was uh, wondering if you had any comments on that, if you're, you're seeing that that being broken through or if maybe that didn't get uh, placed in all the appropriate places or any comments about uh, that type of construction material. Yeah, I, um, I'm not as familiar with what was put in in, in 1998 when they built it. I think it was, um, I know that we have protective barrier walls that work well and um, now, and so I'm not sure if those were with 1998 or updated projects since then. But where we do have this protective barrier, it works. Uh, it works incredibly well, and so we would just want to get it throughout the hospital. Thank you. The last project that we're going to be presenting for DPBH is uh, Project 7362, the NAMS Building 1 Electrical Upgrade. This project will replace the panels, switches, lighting, fire alarm, underground conduit wiring, and telephone data system gateway at Building 1. Um, in FY 2021, NAMS was appropriated state general fund for the plate replacement of the actual phone system but those funds were reverted through AB3 from the recent special session. The existing electrical distributing system for building one is over 50 years old and has far outlived its useful life. The significant age of the system results in a safety issue when staff need to repair or when for staff when interim repairs are needed. Thank you, uh, Ward Patrick, for the record. I would point out that this building one, as I understand it, is, cons if not on a register, is considered historically significant. And so I understand that building will be around for a while. So that would make it a good idea to you know, keep continuing to do even these major maintenance projects like the service, like the service entrance that was recommended being requested here. And then if I could at this time to take a, take a not take a break, but just to switch to a, a topic that I'd like to have discussed at some point, which would be uh, in Northern Nevada at the mental health campus off of Gleddy Way, uh, there's community use, meaning there's uh, lease agreements in some of those buildings. And so uh, I'd like to for some discussion to, to uh, uh, go about on, on that for the board's information. So, you know, so I know that some of those lease agreements uh, were in light of the county using the buildings as is. So there'd be a decreased uh, a need for the state to do maintenance because they were as is. And uh, 
And so I understand in Southern Nevada, the West Charleston campus, there's talk of doing some of those similar activities. And so this is a big topic and maybe we could get, uh, you know, some additional information, summary information from the department about uh, both those current leases, modified leases, proposed leases, and then other items that may be referred to as, uh, here today there was a term used, something about community partner, which I assume that's similar. And uh, so, I'd like, so I want to uh, help the department uh, get the funding they need to, to fulfill the, the Department of Health and Human Services responsibilities on all these buildings. But so in order to uh, do that, the board would need, and, and staff here would need information about uh, the state's responsibility on those. And I know there's several categories that might have different uh, responsibilities. If we could get a brief overview of some of that uh, today, at the, maybe at the end of the presentation or, or now, and then uh, uh, something in writing about that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, we would be happy to provide something in writing and we can give you some information today as well. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Jeff Hague for the record. Um, Warden, would you like that now or at the end of our uh, project presentations. Uh, if it pleases the chair, we'd hear a little overview of that uh, at, at your at your pleasure. Okay, well, uh, happy to provide it now, uh, just quickly, and then uh, provide any detailed information uh, after this as as you may need. So you are correct. Uh, DHHS entered into a lease with Washoe County. Uh, for what is referred to as the Sierra Regional Center buildings located on the southeast quadrant of the campus. Um, that relationship was initiated in 2018, uh, was revised in 2019, and uh, well, quite honestly, we continue to have conversations about the, the appropriate lease document um, for this. But the Board of Examiners in June of 2019 approved a lease I don't have the exact number of buildings off the top of my head, uh, but I will provide that back to the board um, uh, immediately. Uh, but none of the buildings included in that Washoe County lease are included in the projects that we're presenting to you all this afternoon. Um, you are correct, in the Washoe County lease, those buildings were leased as is. Um, and the only thing I believe we were responsible for uh, that's identified in the lease is the roofs of those buildings. Um, Washoe County, since the inception of, uh, of the lease, has invested about $14 million uh, in costs in those facilities or buildings that are incorporated in that lease, um, and we expect that they will continue to invest and maintain in the, uh, those facilities over the, over the term of the lease. Um, so I'll stop there with the NAMS campus and the relationship with Washoe County that's existing and answer any questions uh, before I go uh, down to Las Vegas and give a brief overview of SNAMS. Thank you, Jeff Thank you. or Patrick, for the record. I'm familiar with um, most all of that, and I would point out to the board that uh, similar uh, last session, there were a few projects that were in this category and so at some point those were removed from the CIP. And so, uh, so that just uh, created funding for other deferred maintenance needs in the state of Nevada. And so uh, I do, uh, and my recollection on that is the roofing would still be part of the statewide roofing program as necessary. And so certainly uh, there's a, there is a, uh, user responsibility to coordinate with our roofing program on that and then I also believe that uh, uh, there was some dialogue if not in writing about the envelope would be uh, something that the Public Works Division wasn't uh, uh, comfortable with being responsible for but uh, Washoe County wasn't either in the in conversations at least the department accepted responsibilities for the other parts of the envelope. I don't know if that's in writing, Jeff, or if, if it was something that was discussed. Yeah, uh, Jeff Hague, for the record. So 
Ward, would you just, when you reference uh, uh, envelope, what do you mean by that? Just so I make sure I'm answering your question appropriately. Thank you. Meaning, meaning the walls, windows, and 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 door, you know, and doors. We weren't party to that agreement, but we were. Uh, so I think uh, basically a summary is the walls and windows and doors, the exterior of the building. So as I understand the lease, and I'll forward over a copy for the board's review, the county is responsible for, as you state, the envelope um, of, the, of the structure. So, and I know in the context of the $14 million that they've invested on the facilities, um, that work was, in, was uh, included in many of the facilities. I appreciate it. And uh, at one, just kind of drill down a little on this. Uh, at, I understand uh, building 8B was at one point uh, considered to, to going to go to Washoe County and it was in kind of a list of semi high priority projects. And so I'm not sure if that one's in this list, but uh, uh, I trust uh, that We've stated that none of the Washoe, Washoe projects are in here, so I think that is appreciate that cleansing. And so, yeah, no, you're yeah. So sorry, we're go ahead. No, so thank you, thank you, Jeff. Sorry. And and so, uh, are there any? Uh, you mentioned there's ongoing conversations, and is there a, a timeline for additional projects, for different additional buildings to be uh, moved over to Washoe? county use and responsibility or is it just conversation still yeah so a great question so um, in the context of the project this is outlined in the lease that I'll forward over Washoe County renovated um, what is referred to as 8 Central and 8 South on the campus um, it is the old mental health hospital they renovated that on behalf of the state um, and aging and disability services moved back into that facility earlier this year in April. Um, that is one cleanup item that we need in the lease. Uh, that is the only facility that's impacted by the existing lease that we have a, a cleanup item on. So we're, we're working on an amendment to process that. Um, the, the only other outstanding project uh, that's under consideration now is Washoe County has come back and uh, requested access to roughly 1.3 acres of vacant land uh, located uh, on this the south portion of the campus for a community garden. Uh, and so we are working with our partners over at State Land through that process to understand how that parcel of vacant land could be incorporated into the lease. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Ward Patrick, Ward Patrick. And, and still in the north here, thank you. Uh, Jeff, and, and just to to offer some perspective, the as I understand it, and if you'd comment on this as well, Jeff, uh, Washoe County also renovated some state-owned space for the state's use. So I believe the lease is a no dollar, one dollar lease or no dollar lease, but there was uh, also you know so there was also some benefit that the state received in regarding. Uh, reducing deferred maintenance so you're, you're exactly right um, sorry Jeff Hay for the record so we uh, entertained a zero dollar lease with the county um, as a result of their known 14 million dollar investment on the facilities um, these facilities as, as some of you may be aware of were um, requesters of CIP projects in the past that unfortunately weren't granted and so we were, were the, was a significant value to the state to have these buildings brought up to code and that investment that the county made. Um, and so as a result, uh, we, we enabled the zero dollar lease as an offset to their investment on the facilities. And then the expectation within the lease is that, um, that those buildings are returned to the state uh, at the conclusion of that lease um, in good condition. So Administrator Sheriff just has a, a quick update she'd like to offer. Hi, Lisa Sherrick, Administrator for the Division of Public and Behavioral Health. Um, I just wanted to, since you asked about this topic, um, just make the board aware that we have recently had some, um, well, over the last several months, having conversations with the City of Reno to look at them uh, leasing 
the 10 bed um, part of our Dean Townsend Hospital um, for Crisis Now services for the, the Washoe Reno area. And that, uh, the sole purpose of that is to divert um, individuals from the emergency rooms and ensure that that doesn't um, create an additional burden. Um, so it'd be people that have um, uh, mental illness as well as perhaps some detox services. So we haven't finalized that yet, but since um, uh, this was a topic brought up right now, I thought it was important to share that we're having those conversations and that would be um, a zero dollar lease as well and they would be responsible for any um, little bits that needs to be upgraded within the hospital but since it's part of um, Deanie Townsend as a whole uh, we would be responsible for obviously the HVAC um, those costs since it's very hard to uh, separate those out unless you know more than happy to have a conversation with you afterwards on how we could do that if if that's something to consider yeah, thank you for the information, and we can uh, visit offline if, if necessary. Member Hand, for the record, I'm just curious, what's the duration of the lease with Washoe County, or lease is? Uh, Jeff Haig, for the record, so the current lease is 15 years. Ward Patrick, and then also, Jeff, you were going to uh, give us a little information on Southern Nevada as well at West Charleston? Sure, yes sir, happy to. Uh, Jeff Haig for the record, if I could just before we leave the north, um, uh, Administrator Shurek's comments uh, remind me of the master planning project that's underway uh, that our friends at State Public Works are leading. So um, I think the conclusion of that project will be really a critical guiding document as we continue to evolve the campus. Um, so yes, Ward, to your point, um, in Southern Nevada, we have had ongoing conversations for over the last year and a half or so with Clark County um, in regards to their interest um, really in two pieces of the campus, uh, the SNAMS campus. One is building 3A um, and the other is a 3.7 acre parcel of vacant land that's located on the west portion of the campus uh, between the state and College of Southern Nevada. Uh, their plans are still under development but um, the need at the time, and obviously COVID has changed uh, funding opportunities significantly, um, was to for those areas to be used as transitional housing um, to continue to serve vulnerable populations in line with those populations that are currently being served on the campus. Um, these potential projects are just that, potential projects at this point that they continue to be conversations. They've been significantly impacted. Uh, as a result of COVID, uh, for example, Building 3A uh, is being used by uh, University Medical Center currently in the state's COVID response, um, or is being held for, for utilization in the state's COVID response. And we have not had any follow-up conversations with them uh, in regards to expansion on the campus, uh, actually coming to terms on a lease uh, since COVID has, has come to the state. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that, Jeff. And I just uh, wanted uh, also to let people know that uh, we've been working together with EHHS and uh, meeting with Jeff. And uh, certainly we had the uh, uh, NAMS master planning process that uh, both groups have been engaged in for the uh, Sparks facility. And so just just kind of putting that uh, on the, some of that on the record for the board's consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if that's it, we will get back to our project presentations. Thank you all. Okay, we are back at Kalini uh, Youth Center, our largest juvenile justice facility, and this project um, focuses on replacing uh, irrigation wells and plumbing at the center. Um, it's at the point where we're having regular um, breaks and flooding throughout um, the facility obviously not having water uh, risks our ability to, to serve the kids uh, that we have there um, and so uh, you know a lot of it was uh, originally installed in 1962 when they opened up the facility 
um, and it's, it's time to get those done. Um, if you know about how difficult it is to get out to Caliente anytime we have to have major repairs, um, those are always more expensive than, than trying to do some repair um, in an area that's easy to get to. So I'm happy to answer any questions about this project. Uh, Ward Patrick, for the record, you mentioned uh, past flooding, and so I point out that the Public Works Division acquired a FEMA grant to put in a bridge down there that I think was intended to mitigate some of the flooding in that area, and so I was curious if you could comment on the uh, the beauty of that bridge or the effectiveness. <laughs> uh, I will. The, the flooding that uh, is talked about in the slide is from pipes breaking and not from um, the the creek or the, the wash that's there next to the facility. Um, it is um, amazing bridge to behold if, if you go visit. <laughs> um, and, and take a look. I know we had a, a couple projects last session um, to fix like a, a vaciator nearby that was um, having some issues, but um, there have been no issues in terms of threats to the property from um, natural flooding. It's all threats from outdated plumbing and pipes. Thank you, Ross. Um, and then the next project and the last DCFS one, and again, this project is, you know, the department's top 20 out of all of our projects. Uh, this is for a children's hospital event planning. Uh, this project would um, work on planning uh, the building of an additional children's hospital on that Charleston campus. Um, we know there have been plans before. We have a little um, booklet at Desert Willow that shows what some of the previous plans were. Um, in my mind, this project is really about uh, bringing some of our youngest Nevadans home. Currently, we have 56 um, Nevada children um, spread across the country in treatment facilities uh, out of state, hundreds or thousands of miles away from their parents and families, which complicates treatment, especially um, you know in the time of COVID, but even without COVID. Um, and so this would begin the planning um, for a hospital on the campus uh, where a there's a, a kind of a pad a area where one was envisioned at one point. Uh, we talk about community partners, the kind of the envisioned um, progress of this facility would be that a, a public private partnership where where the state invests the barrier to entry of the service by creating the facility um, and then it would be operated by one or more private providers. There was a potential plan to try to utilize all the space at Desert Willow um, with a public-private partnership a couple of years ago, but because of licensing issues, that um, did not work. Uh, and we're talking about the types of services that might be at this particular facility, um, acute services, so children needing immediate behavioral health, uh, longer-term treatment. Uh, we'd probably have some partial hospitalization there, which is a great step-down service um, or a service to attend before somebody escalates to full-time residential hospital care. Uh, and then we just had a study about uh, children who are um, commercially sexually exploited, which um, you know is, is sex trafficking of children that um, Nevada is, is high on the list of. Um, and their proposal was that a, the, the ideal service to address that concern is, is a receiving center, so a place with um, security and intense uh, behavioral health treatment before finding a safe place um, to re-enter um, into the community. And so um, this project would start that planning um, for a potential building of a facility uh, down the road. And one question there, um, the 3.7 acres that are considered for uh, Clark County, is there uh, any conflict with this uh, proposed site? Siting of, uh, of the children's I hospital. I I don't believe so, but we can uh, can certainly double check, um, check that and, and get back to you. And then I think it's back to Jeff for the last project. Hey, Jeff Haig for the record. Uh, with you, our last project of our top 20 projects, just to preface that, um, is uh, back or still at the Desert Regional Center for Aging and Disability Services. Uh, this is for the interim care facility. Uh, the interim care facility is a, um, 
is a residential facility designed for 48 residents. It currently houses uh, 38 residents with intellectual disabilities. I think it's important to note that these are um, those Nevadans with intellectual disabilities that need the most support. Um, and we provide that support for them here on this campus. Uh, in 2017, we were audited by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and one of the sightings that we received was not providing uh, enough freedom of movement for the people that we serve on campus. Uh, and so before you today is a, um, a project request 21126 for security fencing. Uh, this would fence the residential uh, facility on campus uh, and provide greater freedom of movement for the residents uh, that live there. The second piece of this project is for a, a shade structure. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have a sports court uh, dedicated some years ago, um, and we have tried in previous years um, to accomplish a shade structure uh, over this outdoor recreation area to enable our residents to be able to utilize it year round. Um, and again, to provide them uh, more flexibility um, and more, um, more fun opportunities in this residential environment for them. Um, this campus is located at the corner of Jones and Charleston, just for your orientation, and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Is it true, Ward Patrick, is it true, Jeff, that the crazy fence lady works in your division? I am not aware of that, but I'd, I'd like to meet her. If right. Possible. How yeah. about, uh, so when we met with the, I, I know feel you like there's a story somebody's not telling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, um, Laura. I agree. <laughs> when we met, when we met uh, with our department meetings, we met with all the various presenters, and um, there's a nice uh, person, I think from DRC, that referred to herself as the crazy fence lady. And uh, uh, I think uh, others, other administrators and, and people from the department level would offer that uh, she described herself as the crazy fence lady. And so I think she's the, the, a big advocate for this project is all I was uh, referring, yeah, to, referring to. Yeah, good. I, I look forward to meeting her. I, I won't ask for her by that name, no offense, <laughs> but uh, if she identifies herself, that's the, uh, identifies herself that way that's great yeah. uh, listen we're all excited about this project you know a lot of our residents have been there for a long time you know being able to consider providing them this type of flexibility and normalcy if you will is is pretty cool so if there's no more questions on this this actually concludes uh health and human services presentations for our CIP projects. We're very grateful for your time and attention. Happy to answer any other questions that may have come to mind uh, over the course of our um, early presentation here. If you don't have any, we're happy to give you back 10 minutes and take whatever brownie points that earns us. Member <laughs> <laughs> Hand for the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a job well done. Um, Lisa, this is a tough. Uh, a tough uh, presentation. Um, you know, we had military earlier, and we had veterans today, and uh, this is another, uh, you know, obviously important set of services that are needed in our communities. And we appreciate all your hard work in the presentation. Yeah, thank you for that, and happy to answer any follow-up questions that the board may have. Um, and and Ward, I'll be sure to circle back with the the documents as it relates to the Washoe County lease on NAMS. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. We have a five minute break. Or sure. We, we our next see. presenter yeah. comes at three, three okay. so we yeah. can. Yeah, let's see if we could uh, take a five minute break and stretch our legs and be great. Be back at, at 3 p.m. Thank you, Laura. Laura, will you yeah. want be? Uh oh, we're unmuted, guys. Oh, Kent, your mask hit the ground. I pick it up. Yeah, right. I know. Don't pick it up. Yeah. yeah. Is he doing it from here? I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy. Oh, I know Ron's going to be in his office. Yeah, and everybody else, all the other folks, they're they're online. Oh, okay. So they're they're ready and waiting.
Alrighty. Well, I'm going to take advantage here. Yeah. Susie Miller. Is that the crazy fence lady? Yeah. <laughs> you should have led with that's how she refers to her watching. I know. Yeah. She'll be excited. She might get online. <laughs> <laughs> She'll zoom bomb you. She drew special attention to a lower priority project for the group. And it worked. Yeah. What do you think, Brian? We're uh, making our way. Right? Has some, has some work in the military projects. Seems like there's a lot of work and there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, I, there's a lot of work on those, but I'm looking at them. I have a suspicion you might be recommending most or all. I'll put it that way. Don't you think? Yeah. Just looking at the list, it's it's also, it's been, you know, like, like if somebody asked, why are you doing so many of those? You know, the answer might be, this is a neglected portion of their portfolio, mm -hmm. right? And we spend, well, we, we spend $14 million, we get $17 million. Right, so, and it's, it's, uh, it's only 14, it's 12 million actually, because the 17 take away the milcon. That's true. 17 minus five is 12. You already have two mm -hmm. for them to go get. And only 10 more, but uh, if Corrections has been getting 60 million per year with 3 million square feet, granted it's harder use, but it's harder construction as well. Yeah. And uh, you know they've been getting something much smaller. So it seems so. That's why I asked the question because I wanted to make sure we're kind of on the record that if they got a proportionate more than normal there's some some dialogue during the board meeting good reason well and i don't look at their list it doesn't seem like they have what you call like a, a dog really right they're i mean there's stuff that you could push but they're not bad one of the challenges with hhs is they're so program oriented They've got all these programmatic needs early on in the list. <coughs> and uh, so, so oh. as a facility gotcha. person, you have to go down. Video and mic check, anybody? I can hear you. You look pretty good in that suit and tie. They're checking themselves. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not the Hawaiian shirt day. <laughs> Is my mic okay? Projects on the presentation until I yeah, back I hear you too. Like loud and clear, Ron. Thanks. Word 100 million. I'm not as excited anymore. I'm a little panicked. Yeah, well, so that's a challenge. So who's first? I think we're muted, right? No, I don't know. That is a good question. I've been wondering that myself, actually. <laughs> hey, Sean, all right. <laughs> And sure, uh, did you do a mic check? Sure, I'll do a mic check. Okay, you're good. 180 you're good. Million in, uh, Are they doing the um, PowerPoints on their end? And we're yeah, talking so through like them? Yeah. Um, I think we had set it up that way. So. Okay. Yeah. And that's how I set it up as well. Okay. Yeah, I sent it to, yeah, uh, so institutional to everybody. So, so those are for hey, Kevin. How are you doing? Doing okay, Dave. How are you doing? So, uh, <laughs> just trying to get through all the budget stuff, right? Oh gosh, yeah. That's kind of. I mean, I might have tried in, in my straw man. I might have found three or four of these kind of. But we would discuss that with them because they all seem pretty, pretty reasonable projects that are needed, and they're backlogged because of lack of state funding. Right. I believe that Ken is probably going to go first. A lot of challenges. And then we'll see who we introduce as they get second. That's the Sounds good. 
What's in, so since we're muted, what's interesting is their number one priority. I guess just be ready, huh? Ready, <laughs> ready, yeah. fast, ready, ready to, to talk. talk. So ready, ready to sell. sell. Well, yeah. so then they alerted the finance office that this is an emergency. So we go sit down with them, and but before we go into that room, I ask them my question. Not that they're perfect, but they're a perspective. Right. They offer perspective. So it's like forensic. What are your forensic needs? Here she described they, they have 167 and they're 117 or something for a 70%, yeah. 71%. But so when we discuss them, they also have some of those then, whatever their data was so. then, some of those yeah. people well, contributed to well, the need could be housed yeah. elsewhere. Uh, and this is forensic. And so this was considered an emergency. And so, uh, so we sat down with the budget director in the state, which is one step from the governor's office. And uh, we didn't, uh, you know, the, the finance office. I have to say that I'm glad I'm not have to make all the decisions about where to spend the capital improvement funds. Their justification. That's but that's a monumental task. They didn't make it an emergency project. They didn't go find money. For I see what they go through, and I can only imagine how tough that is. Just amazing how many projects they get in. Yeah, how they have to prioritize the them and, and try to pick and choose. Change. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. right. Go for them. But so and, you said. Yeah. So. So not a not a not a good fun task. task. That's for sure. No. And they lined up. They referred to a lady who. Like, you know, <clears> just one more step though. Then we've got to go to the legislature for it. You know, if it goes forward, it still got to go to the legislature and go from there. But. <coughs> they, they, they referenced that the number one project only eight months ago as an emergency and uh, precautionary <laughs> in the same breath. No. But you know, certainly if you were building new construction, it would take. Are you going to present them back here? Is that okay? Yeah. No, why not? Right. I would present them right there. As long as you speak up. Yeah, yeah I can. No, try, try, hard. try now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the court reporter still. Yes, yeah. she was Operate. waiting for the ladies' room. Yep. Because it's a one occupado at a time. Yep, it's COVID compliant. On you. Thank you. We have our all our board members back. That's a big one. That's a big one. Yep. Living the dream, that's for sure. Sorry. So we got everybody ready to go? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for the uh, the time to take a, a stretch of leg break. And um, uh, it's like a few minutes after three, and we're, we're ready to go with the uh, Department of Administration. And Kent, are you going to? Uh, take the lead on this? Sure. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the board. Um, my name is Kent Lefebvre, Deputy Administrator, and I'm going to present four projects for the Department of Administration. The first four, pro or the first four projects are the Attorney General's Office, Central Plant, the Advanced Planning for Grant Sawyer Building, the lease purchase uh, of a building. Ready. Next slide. Oh, no, okay. next slide. That's all. Okay. We're good. Thank you. And then the construction of administration building on the east of the site. So if 
we could go to department rank number one. <coughs> this is the Attorney's General Attorney General's Office Central Plan Renovation. This is department rank number one. Next one. And this is a picture of the building which is situated directly west of the Capitol building. This project is $1.8 million and the scope of the project is to renovate the central plant heating and cooling equipment. This renovation includes the replacement of the chiller, cooling tower, boilers, pumps, piping, and related controls. The design of this project was developed as part of CIP 19M30. However, the construction portion of the project was swept with a special session and an a, a SB1. So are there any questions on that project? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to the next slide. This is the priority two item for Department of Administration, the advanced planning of Grant Sawyer office building remodel. Next slide. Here's a exterior picture of the building as it presently stands. Next slide. So many of the systems in this Grant Sawyer building have been uh, compromised over time, worn out, um, they're beyond their serviceable life. These are just two examples of some failed plumbing and mechanical uh, equipment that represent two of many, many systems within that building. This project is a, an advanced planning project planned at $5.3 million. And there are several improvements to the building that will be studied during the design portion of the build of the project, including infill infilling the atrium by the main lobby entrance. If any of you are familiar with the building, there's a huge lobby that's four or five stories high. And one of these improvements is to infill that lobby at levels three and four to create a more human space as you enter the building but also to uh, provide additional leasable space on levels three and four the next improvement i'd like to touch on is the public hearing chambers for the building. <coughs> this is a opportunity for the building to I should say for the for the remodel of the building for additional public space and public chambers that are comparable with other public chambers in the state. The current public chambers are, they have very low ceilings and columns are in the way of sight lines. And by pulling the public chambers outside of the building, it will give a very, um, a very good experience for those not only presenting but also for the legislative bodies. Another improvement for the Grand Story building is vertical circulation and this would be located on the back of the building and provide additional uh, elevator service to the building for dignitaries and elected officials. Also on the back of the building would be a dignitary parking canopy and that would provide a measure of security and safety for elected officials and other dignitaries entering into and out of the building. 
The other improvement that I would like to mention is adding the addition of electric vehicle charging stations for electric cars on that campus. As I mentioned before, the project is in, proposed as an advanced, advanced planning. And this is a continuation of project 19 P01, which a portion of this project was swept during the SB1 uh, special session. Any questions on this project? Hearing none, we'll go to number three. This is the lease purchase for administration building on the Kincaid site. Next slide. This is a view of the Capitol complex before the Kincaid building was demolished in 2017. Next slide. And that red box on the slide is the proposed location for this lease to purchase Department of Administration building. Next slide. The total budget for this project is 92.4 million. This project will design and construct a 100,000 square foot building in the Capitol complex for the Department of Administration to house several agencies, including the Director's Office, Administrative Services, Enterprise IT Services, and Fleet Services, amongst others. This project also includes the demolition of the Blasdale building. The design of this building will accommodate the projected growth for the Department of Administration and its sections for the next 10 years. The project is proposed to be funded using a lease purchase arrangement. Next slide. This is the administrative complex, or the building at the Sahara Complex in Las Vegas. Next slide. So this location is right next to the new DMV on East Sahara at McLeod. Next slide. Next slide. And that red box again is the location, the proposed location of this building. And there's a concept plan. Yes, thank you. The total budget for this project is 107 million roughly and the scope of this project will design and construct a building at the East Sahara site for buildings and grounds to rent to state agencies. Professional services and soft costs are planned to be funded within state <coughs> and the remaining costs will be paid with revenue bonds. The source of funding for the revenue bonds will be rent collected by the Buildings and Grounds Division, or section of the State Public Works Division. This rent is to be distributed across all building spaces, spaces which Buildings and Grounds charges rent. Any questions? Okay. Lord Patrick, for the record, I have some supplemental information. Uh, last session, this project was an alternative to a tower at the Sawyer Building site. And so that alternative was recommended by the board to the governor's office. And so we intend to uh, uh, bring that alternative project back into the mix here. And uh, so that alternative project was recommended by the board to the governor's office. The governor's office recommended that project to the legislature and it was not funded during the session. And so uh, we presented it similarly, but as an alternative to this project here. And so I wanted to uh, make sure that was on the record. Thank you. Mem Member Hand for the record. Uh, thank you, Ward. Um, Sean Stewart, you, uh, you talked about um, renderings earlier. How did that? previous slide look to you with the, the future building. Are you okay? Is your heart pounding? <laughs> <laughs> and, 
Again, I have total faith in Warren Patrick. <laughs> Can you bring that up? Uh, the reloaded side. Okay, so they're all separately loaded. I'm yeah. sorry, apologize for that, everybody. But uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for that. And I would point out that we had a uh, design team with a builder that put that uh, bird's eye view together. And so uh, it, yeah, I'm sure it would please. It pleases me, and I hope it pleases the board as well. Thank you. <coughs> Looks like I'm up. Can everybody see me and hear me okay? Yeah. Looking good, Robbie. So, Ward, do you control the PowerPoint or do I? I do. Okay, there you go. You have 100% control, Ward. Thank you, sir. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is talking about the Department of Administration supporting and promoting and enhancing government efficiency and innovation to provide Nevadans with quality access to government services. You can go ahead, Ward. <clears throat> this is a little bit more, these, these next few slides are really going to talk more about the Fleet Service Division and what we do for uh, our department and for the rest of the state of Nevada. Uh, the division provides safe and efficient, environmentally friendly and cost-effective ground transportation solutions to all state uh, departments, divisions, and employees. Go ahead, Ward. Um, the Fleet Service Division, we do long-term assigned vehicles to all departments and divisions, and we also have short-term vehicle management that we uh, provide at both of our uh, actually all three of our locations in Carson City, Reno, and, and Las Vegas. Um, approx we have approximately about 1,230 vehicles in our, in our uh, vehicle uh, inventory right now. And uh, from fiscal 20, we had about an, in Las Vegas, just the Las Vegas Valley alone, we had an increase of about 92 vehicles, and which gives us about a, 172 vehicles to one on as far as mechanic ratio. Go ahead, Ward. And I probably should have said for the record, this is Robbie Burgess from the Fleet Service Division probably a while back. I apologize for that. Um, the Fleet Service Division provides maintenance, uh, long-term long -term fleet planning for agencies, um, acquisition and disposal, disposal of vehicles, uh, vehicle reporting, fueling and cleaning, and accident management. Uh, one of our... Uh, key functions is to create solutions to help our customers with their vehicle needs. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ward. Our division philosophy is to provide state agencies modern solutions to solve their transportation needs in a cost-effective manner utilizing technology and strategic fleet management and industry best, best practices to enhance our customer experience and control cost. Go ahead, Ward. Uh, the division does partner closely with the private sector to ensure our products are delivered to our customers is, it, is delivered efficient and cost-effective manner while focusing on one goal is and that's to solve our uh, customers issues quickly and efficiently and when i say customers um, our customers are all um, state uh, departments and divisions so because we are internally funded we are supporting our our, our outside sister departments and uh, we do outsource approximately 20% of our 20% 20, 20 of our short-term rentals and uh, multiple types of vehicle repairs. Go ahead, Ward. Uh, these are all the types of vehicles that we do support: sedans, SUVs, police vehicles, uh, light-duty and heavy-duty trucks and vans. Go ahead, Ward. Um, we're running with a, a approximate staff of 16 folks. Um, our fleet size, like I was saying before, is about 1,230 vehicles. 
We approximately have 612 vehicles just alone in the Las Vegas Valley, and there's approximately about 8,000 um, state of Nevada employees that work in the Las Vegas uh, Las Vegas Valley. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, through cost containment and through strategic management, our resources and locations and assets. We uh, have the industry expertise, fleet decisions are based on factual data, fleet experience, and industry-specific knowledge, not personal preference or personal experiences. The consolidation of reduce, uh, resources reduces the full-time employees and, and equals money for, for uh, the other state departments and divisions. Go ahead, Lord. So this is a view of the this may look familiar to you folks with the board that was um, beautiful Robbie <laughs> and mr. Stewart that's not a, just a square box um, and there's a reason for that we had to the prior my predecessor had to uh, justify this uh, facility to the legislature and we were informed to make it pretty so this is a box that with a little bit of prettiness on top of it but uh, this is these uh, Next slides are showing different views of the uh, of the facility at the lot at the Grant Sawyer. One of one of when we were doing the planning with this, we we tried to match the look of the existing Grant Sawyer facility, so the the facility did look like it was meant to be there from the very beginning. Um, on site, we do have. Um, on, the, on that view there, if you look to the left, those are all EV uh, charging stations. So we are uh, uh, following SB 254 with the governor's recommendations of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we are looking to become more and more environmentally friendly as, as time goes on. Um, with that, uh, does the board have any questions? The Department of Transportation has a um, facility just literally 100 yards, 200 yards up the road. Um, it, they have all the fuel, the, the fossil fuel uh, capabilities and resources there. So that it gave us the opportunity to make this a environmentally friendly facility in, in Las Vegas at the Grant Sawyer facility. Please. Sure. Uh, so what it, uh, and I think you've stated this, but there's a certain number of square feet of state offices that are either owned or leased north of Washington Street that justifies this this facility. So there's just so many uh, state vehicles that will utilize this facility that are north. And so uh, uh, that is kind of one of the major justifications is uh, these people are driving so far to get south right now to get their maintenance done. Yeah, our existing, Robbie Burgess for the record again, um, our existing facility, we're not planning on closing the existing facility on La Cienega. Uh, that physical location of that facility is south of McCarran. So if, if anyone is familiar with the, the Las Vegas Valley, um, we have a lot of state agencies and departments that, that operate in the north. So yeah, I, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with the traffic that's in Las Vegas. If they're coming from the Grant Sawyer facility, going to my facility down south, um, south of McCarran, it's about a 45 minute to hour trip one way, just getting um, getting from there, from Grant Sawyer, to our existing facility. So if you're, if you're doing the one way there and the one way back, I mean, that's two hours out of the day just in, just in travel time. And the final, another final comment would be uh, noticing the funding source that Robbie's mentioned this, but this is an enterprise fund. And so the the next two presenters are also going to be in the similar uh, similar uh, category, I believe, where uh, uh, the the state will uh, fund this project, and then uh, the enterprise fund will be paying it back as a debt service with a with an internal debt service instrument so over a, a longer period term depending on how that goes with the treasurer's office and other fiscal conditions so this is uh, not a request for state funding but uh, is uh, is going to plan to be paid back out of operating costs over time member Hanford thank thank you for that explanation and uh, I'm curious about the, the solar panels in the background are they part of the is that is that architectural fluff or is that 
<laughs> part of the plan. Bobby Burgess, for the for the record, uh, Chairman Han, that uh, those are existing solar panels that that are there on the Grand Sawyer uh, complex. So um, they were not movable. So I we had to choose either the north or southern portion of the property to to place the fleet service division, and we went with the, the north side. Thank you. One more final comment. As you've seen before, the Sawyer building is planned to be renovated, remodeled. And the plans for that remodel include vacating the building. And so some might ask, why add maintenance for vehicles when the building may be vacant for three years, the immediately adjacent building? And the answer is basically what I stated before, is that there's uh, 10 times that many people in the north that are going to be using that facility. So, so that would be an e easy question for, some, for someone to ask. And the answer is there's 10 times that many vehicles needing maintenance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. These Department of Administration administrators really clean up nice. <laughs> you sure do, Ward. <laughs> <coughs> Sunday finest. Ready for eats? Ward, you just let me know when you're ready to go once they have the slides up. There we go. Uh, good afternoon, uh, for the record. Uh, this is Dave Hawes, Administrator for the Enterprise IT Services Division within the Department of Administration. Also joining me this afternoon is uh, Sean Montier, our IT Chief over Enterprise Computing and Data Center Operations. Uh, we'd like to thank you uh, for the opportunity to present our projects to the board. We recognize that you've uh, had a lot of presentations and a lot of valid requests, so we appreciate your time. Um, we'll try to keep our presentation as brief as we can. The Enterprise IT Services Division, also known as EATS, is responsible for hosting and supporting statewide enterprise level computing services for every agency in state government. Enterprise services provided include mainframe computing, statewide network connectivity and telecommunication services such as phone and wide area and local area network services, virtual server farm and uh, data storage hosting, high speed, high volume printing, VPN connectivity and hosting for remote workers, which has been heavily used here in the last few months as a result of COVID and other computing services. Each day, millions of electronic transactions supporting daily agency program and business processes flow through the enterprise computing equipment and servers. These critical computing services are physically housed and safeguarded within the centralized state computing facility located in Carson City. The state's investment in computing equipment and cyber infrastructure at the data center is in the multi-millions of dollars. Maintaining the facility in proper operating order is important to sustaining daily computing operations for the state. The two uh, each capital improvement projects in front of you are requests to correct and repair several data center issues that are occurring. If you go ahead to the next slide. The first project is a request to remove current failing concrete structures at the back of the facility. We are requesting to replace the pedestrian stairs and ramp to meet ADA compliance and, and safety issues and repair and re replace the concrete that supports the large access gate and ground dock lift. 
The stairs and other concrete platforms at the back of the facility have become a safety hazard. The concrete is crum crumbling and is now a trip and fall uh, uh, safety issue. The handrails are, are no longer secure and the ramp, which is a fire exit, is not ADA compliant. Uh, the data center was constructed in 1970 uh, with an addition occurring in 2006 and it is currently 22,928 square feet. Pallets of equipment, paper, and other computing supplies are transported into the building weekly and daily using the access gate and dock lift, which is used for all deliveries that cannot be brought through the front lobby. The access gate has problems with concrete cr crumbling at the base, and around the handrails and stairs, the concrete is falling out as you can kind of see in the pictures there to give you an idea what's occurring. Uh, each of these issues is causing a fall and trip hazard uh, for vendors, suppliers, and staff that use the stairs. The access gate is used to receive large and expensive computing equipment, paper and other freight deliveries requiring direct access to the computing floor and needing a forklift uh, to unload. Without the access gate and stairs, computing operations such as our large print operations and expensive equipment deliveries would be hampered or unable to continue without a means for efficient and safe delivery of equipment and supplies. The ramp, which is included in the repair request, is a secondary employee entrance to the facility and is a fire exit. It is not ADA compliant and the concrete is crumbling, resulting in safety issues. The exit ramp is needed for our operation team to properly egress out of the facility in case of fire. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Our second project uh, is the computing room cooling system. Uh, this request is to replace the equipment that sustains the computing center and keeps it cool. As previously stated, the state has a very large investment in enterprise computing equipment and cyber infrastructure that is used daily by agency programs and business operations. This equipment produces significant BTUs and the heat must be properly dissipated and cooled for the equipment to operate properly. Without proper cooling, the equipment begins to fail or malfunction causing work and business stoppage. And in a worst case scenario, we could lose state uh, uh, data if uh, we were not able to keep it cool and uh, protected in the case of a catastrophic failure. This request is to replace and augment the existing air conditioning equipment that serves the main server floor, computer workshop, and communications equipment room at the facility. The computing facility's air, existing air conditioning equipment is more than 15 years old and is or has reached end of useful life. As can be seen in the photo, the cooling equipment is industrial grade infrastructure and will need professional redesign, replacement, and upgrading. Our request is to properly replace the cooling system to avoid unplanned expenses and avoid state enterprise compute processing shutdown due to overheating or aged equipment failure. Um, just would like to make the board aware that uh, early in May 2020, one of the chiller motors in the data center failed. The cost of the integrated motor and compressor replacement was approximately $43,000 of unplanned expenditure. The chillers are mission critical, especially during the summer months, for proper operation of the state's competing environment and equipment. Without chiller operation and redundancy, chiller downtime could result in a need to shut down the data center, uh, data center servers and network equipment, resulting in program processing stoppage and performance impact to many agencies. Um, these projects are important to sustaining uh, computing operations for the entire state. We appreciate your uh, attention to our request. And that concludes the presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Lord Patrick, for the record, I'm on the first project, the title is replace data center facility stairs and I know it was originally scoped that way but now includes the equipment of the automated gate and the dock lift and so it would it, we'd like to work with you and modify that title if that's okay Dave 
that would be fine. fine. Absolutely. And then one thing we should consider and can talk offline is if, uh, if, if you may be interested in combining these projects either now or later, if, if they both go through into the governor's recommendation, the legislature staff would likely ask if we would like to combine those. And so we should consider that when we, as this project moves ahead. Uh, makes, makes sense, sense to me. Thank you, board. Okay, thanks. Any additional questions? If not, I'll turn it over to Kevin for his presentation. Good afternoon, members of the board. I am Kevin Doty, Administrator for State Purchasing. And we have one project to be considered today, and that is a renovation of our uh, warehouse in Las Vegas. State Purchasing, obviously what we mainly do is buy goods and services. Public Works does construction contracts, NDOT does roads, and we do everything else. But in addition to overseeing the acquisition of more than $3 billion in goods and services every year, we are responsible for tagging and keeping track of state property that is purchased and then um, controlling surplus property. And the warehouse in Las Vegas is used for the purposes of storing surplus property, which other agencies can then come by and, and use. Uh, pick up, have delivered to their agencies. Um, primarily, it's a lot of, um, oh, and there's our, our slide presentation. <laughs> We're working on it. Sorry, Kevin. No problem. Thank My you. slides aren't that good anyway. Um, yeah, efficiency, obviously making use of um, what we've already purchased. Uh, next slide, please. And this is our regulatory responsibility to handle excess state property. Next slide. That's our statutory responsibility. Next slide. And that's in regulation. Next slide. So basically, the way this works is that state purchasing years ago used to oversee the USDA uh, surplus food program. And that was transferred to, to the Department of Agriculture. So we don't have any employees in Las Vegas. We pay Department of Agriculture employees to move surplus property for us from agency locations to and from our Las Vegas warehouse. Um, this shows the number of uh, transactions into the warehouse. The next slide. And that's the, the number of transactions going out. Basically, the Las Vegas warehouse is extremely run down. Uh, so much so that we can't use it right now for federal surplus, which is another program we operate. Um, federal surplus has uh, certain security controls that we just can't guarantee at the Las Vegas warehouse right now, which is unfortunate because we can get some pretty good stuff from the feds because the federal government has a tendency to be a little bit wasteful. Um, but uh, basically, we have the statutory obligation to store surplus property until it can be reused. And that's why we need to make the Las Vegas warehouse um, usable for that purpose. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Board Patrick, for the record, uh, we are working, I'm looking for confirmation, Kevin, that we're working with you to modify the scope of this project to make it affordable and uh, currently is considered unaffordable with the current scope and we're also uh, working to clarify the funding source that would be like was described before where the state would front the money for a biennium upon completion the using agency in their operating budget would be responsible for some internal debt service Yes, that's, uh, that's my understanding, Ward, that it would be built into the purchasing assessment that is paid by agencies, but I'm not an expert on, on finance, and I, and I completely agree with uh, your suggestion that we try to downsize the cost of this. Um, we just need warehouse space, so we're not, we're not looking for anything fancy, just something functional. No spaceships. <laughs> And 
if there are no other questions, then uh, I guess I will turn it over to, I guess, Ron comes next. Correct. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Ron Cothran. I'll spell my name. It's R-O-N. Last name is C-O-T-H-R-A-N. I am the Deputy Administrator and I'll be presenting the CIP projects for the Buildings and Grounds section and the Marlet Lake Water System. I'll wait for the slide to catch up. And Ron, uh, remember that you're to save me a couple minutes at the end of your presentation to go over the statewide programs briefly. Thank you. Got it. Thank, Thank you, Warren. Next slide, please. Okay. This project is priority number nine. It is to replace the electrical service at the Carson City DMV and is 100% highly funded. This project will upgrade the electrical service entrance, underground feeder, utility transformer, and main switchboard. The utility transformer and main switchboard are known to fail and are subject to damage. The existing equipment is approximately 30 years old and has reached the end of its useful life expectancy and needs to be replaced. This project is priority number 10 and it will replace the 46 VAB terminal units at the Flamingo DMV and is 100% highway funded. Only the VABs need to be replaced as the rest of the mechanical equipment was replaced in 1995. Typically with a commercial building, a VAB within the HVAC system has individual controls for smaller zones. When a VAB stops working, the dampers can remain closed or in the open position and cannot be adjusted. Additionally, sometimes the fans will stop working and they cannot be controlled by a direct digital control, also known as DDC. Currently, the VABs are beyond their useful life expectancy and have begun to fail. Ron, if I can pause, I have a question for Tito, uh, member Tiberti. If you could even believe that that building was open the first week I was here at Public Works. <laughs> And Governor Bob Miller uh, wanted it re repainted before opening, and so that was a little trivia about the age of this building. So about 25 years old, and uh, Governor Miller was uh, in office then. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know what to say about that word. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for, no for the record, Ron Cothran again. Um, <laughs> this project is priority number 11. 27 and 35 and I apologize for jumping around but they're all very similar projects they are all structural projects so you may see a couple of times throughout my presentation where I actually have a few priorities all in one um, proposes structural reinforcements and building rehabs for the heroes the armory and the Stewart water tower these structures were constructed in the early 1900s and they are not structurally sound if a major seismic event were to happen, the buildings and water tower would encounter major damage and could have complete failure. This project would provide for safer buildings and a safer water tower and will preserve the history for Nevadans. This project is priority number 12 and proposes HVAC renovations at the Carson City DMV and is 100% highly funded. The Carson City DMV has numerous types of heating air conditioning systems to include package units, boilers, chillers, cooling towers. All of the systems are older than 20 years, are beyond their useful life expectancy, and are failing. Once these systems are replaced, they will be energy efficient and can be managed with a DDC. The DDC will enable us to remote control temperature adjustments and will notify us when there is an alarm or a system problem allowing B&G to fix the problem before the building occupants are aware there is an issue. This project assists the state in achieving the goals set out in Senate Bill 254 and the Governor's Executive Order that states, the primary U.S. climate goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 26 to 28 percent below the 2005 levels by 2025. 
This slide not only pertains to the previous slide about heating and air conditioning, but all future slides within my presentation that are about heating and air conditioning. The manufacturer's warranty on a heat exchanger is 20 years. Please look at the picture on the left. The heat exchanger is a thin gauge steel that expands and contracts when the system heats up and cools down. And with the expansion and contraction over time, this causes the steel to weaken and to crack. When the heat exchanger has a crack, it will leak carbon monoxide, also known as CO, into the occupied space. CO is a gas which can cause headaches, nausea, dizziness, breathlessness, and death. Approximately 1,000 people die every year in the U.S. from CO poisoning. The picture on the right shows a typical compressor that uses R22 refrigerant. R22 refrigerant is no longer EPA compliant and no longer sold in the U.S. as of January of 2020. This project is priority number 13 and proposes to restore the Capitol domes as they are cracking and are leaking. The last restoration of the domes was in 1993. The domes will repair and paint and uh, will be repaired and painted, sorry, to prevent further deterioration. The fascia, soffit, windows, doors, and sandstone mortar joints have not been repaired and or painted since the Capitol renovation in 1979. The scope of this project will be performed on the exterior renovation, will perform exterior renovations at the Capitol and the Annex building. <clears throat> this project is priority number 14. It proposes to repair the Hobart Dam as it is a significant safety hazard and is not in compliance with NRS 535 dam safety. This CIP project will provide schematic design to rehab and will perform structural and functional upgrades of the Hobart Dam. The scope of work will include an, 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 a, an assessment of the existing conditions, regrading, replacement of riprap, spillway repair, discharge piping, and valve repair. Failure of the dam would not only interrupt water supply to Carson City and Story County, but will potentially damage property and endanger lives. I apologize. Does somebody have a question? I would comment. Okay. Ward Patrick, for the record. Uh, on the prior slide, uh, we're working to remove some of the interior renovation scope on project number 13. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Um, so we we're going to believe uh, we were going to remove the interior and just keep it as an exterior renovation. Does that, does that sound correct? Or, but exactly. Yes, that's what I was hoping for. Yep, just so you know that the presentation is a little different than the materials, and so we're working that out. Then all, another comment on the current project, which is number 14, the Hobart Reservoir Dam. Uh, I think you're, you're uh, to compliment your presentation. We've received a FEMA grant to do the design and grant application on that one. Did you go, start doing that one yet? I appreciate you pointing that out. Yeah, the asterisk with the 10 million and the, the grant funding uh, yeah. on the title. Yeah, I apologize for not um, for not saying that in the presentation. Thank you, Warren. Yep. So, so let me continue. So, we received a two hundred thousand dollar FEMA grant to do the design and the uh, application for a future grant. And so, this ten million dollars is uh, not money in hand, but a planned grant application. And then, as background, I would offer that last session. We are in a similar condition for the Marlette Dam, and we've since applied and received a nationally competitive FEMA grant for the Marlette Dam. And uh, you know, one might think greed wouldn't get you more money. However, uh, in our conversations with the State uh, Division of Emergency Management, they also consider us having a favorable uh, opportunity here and that's bolstered by the fact that we did have that the prior grant and the region 9 FEMA uh, personnel have have been to the site and are seeing these projects positively thank you Ron. Thank, thank you for, yeah thank, thank you for the clarification that was I appreciate that thank you very much for Ron Cawthorn for the record um, this project is priority number 15 and proposes to demo the cottages. These 15 cottages were constructed in the early 1960s. 
These buildings are considered to be located within a capital complex in Carson City and are an eyesore with boarded up windows, dilapidated siding, and doors. The exterior and the grounds are maintained by buildings and grounds at a cost of approximately $10,000 a month to water the grass. BNG would like to demo these buildings and install zero scape. Capitol Police's resources are continuously needed in an attempt to keep the homes off of the property. In order to make these buildings habitable, it would take a complete renovation to include electrical, plumbing, fire suppression, asbestos abatement, and to bring the buildings up to current code. The cost to renovate would be more costly than to completely demolish and rebuild new buildings. This project assists the state in achieving the goal set out in Senate Bill 254 and the governor's executive order to reduce energy consumption. This project is priority number 16. The Blasto building was constructed in 1957. The radiant heating system is on the exterior walls and is unable to heat, heat the interior cubicles. Due to this, employees that work in interior cubicle spaces will bring in space heaters. The electrical cannot keep up with the demand of today's technology to include space heaters, coffee makers, printers, computers, etc. There are 20 amp breakers in the building. The max capacity of a 20 amp breaker is 16 amps or 80%. The building occupants consistently overload the circuits and trip the breakers. When the breaker is tripped, it's because there's too much current draw on the system, which can produce heat through the wire. If the breaker does not trip properly, it will cause the wire to overheat and catch on fire. This building's electrical system has surpassed its life expectancy of 50 years and needs to be replaced. The outdated radiant heating system is beyond its useful life expectancy. It is rusted and in many locations have broken valves. This project will propose the install of a more conventional forced heating and air system. In order for the system to be more effective, new windows will need to be installed. The windows currently leak air, are original, and are single pane. This project assists the state in achieving the goal set out in Senate Bill 254 and the governor's executive order to reduce energy consumption. Marlette Lake water system monitors water levels on storage tanks, valves, and water flow rates using a SCADA system. I would like to tell you a story how important a SCADA system is. The pipe in this story was installed in 1877. In 2018, the Marlette team got an alarm from the SCADA system on their cell phone that there was 750 PSI water flowing through the pipe. Normal water flows are at 680 PSI. Because there was an additional 70 PSI flowing through the pipe, the Marlet team knew there must be a break in the line. The Marlet team had the water turned off within nine minutes. The only way that they could have done that and to have known that there was a problem is by having this data system. The break happened under a private owner's home. The owner of the home thought there was an earthquake. The home starts to rumble, the carpet and floor starts to lift with water and mud. Without the data system, the owner of the home could have died. Currently, the data system is outdated. We can no longer get replacement parts, and we cannot add to the system. We are in need of adding 72 more monitoring set points. This CIP project will upgrade the SCADA system and will provide for the needed an additional 72 set points. Project is priority number 18. This is a 41,000 square foot building. This building has two types of heating and air conditioning. The smaller units are commonly known as packaged units, and the larger units are known as multi-zone units. The refrigerant in the multi-zone units is R22, and as of January 2020, is no longer manufactured in the United States. These units have had numerous compressor failures causing the air conditioning to stop working. In Las Vegas, with the extreme heat, a compressor failure can render parts of the building to be uninhabitable. Changing these multi-zone units will help the state achieve the goal set out in Senate Bill 254 and the Governor's Executive Order to reduce energy consumption. This project is priority number 19. The Supreme Court snow melt system is an electric heat trace that has failed. The electric, electric heat trace has met its life expectancy of 10 years. During the winter months, ice and snow builds up on the driveway, and without a snow and ice melt system, the driveway can become slick and can cause an accident. This project proposes to install a new 20-year hydronic system that will work in conjunction with the new boilers that were installed this year.
This project is priority number 20, 21, 38, and 44. It's the Icon, Library and Archives, Bell Rose, and Frankie Sue buildings all have elevators that are beyond their useful life expectancy. The life expectancy of an elevator is 30 years. The Icon building has an original elevator from 1959. These older elevators do not comply with the new safety laws that require multiple safety systems and do not comply with the ADA. Ele elevators kill, on average, 30 people and seriously injure 17,000 people every year in the U.S. The Decatur DMV is project number 22 and is 100% highway funded and will install a new camera system. Priority 37 is the Attorney General's. 43 is the Supreme Court will replace the existing security systems. The Decatur DMV needs a security system as there have been several attempts to break into this building. The Attorney General's and Supreme Court has security systems that are analog and are obsolete and we can no longer get replacement parts. It is important for the life, safety, and security of state assets, elected officials, state employees, and the public that all the systems be replaced with digital systems. This project is priority number 23 and includes an upgrade to the internet and phone system at the education building. Currently, the building has CAT3 cable with slow internet speeds of 10 megabytes per second. This project proposes the install of CAP5 with internet speeds of up to 1,000 megabytes per second. This project would dramatically improve the efficiency of the education staff. Ron, for a second, Ward Patrick for the record. Uh, on this project, uh, there's been some scope that uh, hadn't been known prior to the printing of the CIP book, and our PMs are working with buildings and ground staff to make sure that the appropriate scope is in that project. So the next time we see this project here, it will likely to have uh, some different scope. We're also uh, under consideration, there's some consideration for CARES Act, the COVID uh, funding, there might be some COVID funding for some parts of that project. Thank you very much, Ward. I appreciate it. Yep, thank you. For the record, Ron Cawthorn. Priority number 24 is to replace the UPS and DDC at the Bryant Building. The UPS has had numerous problems over the last two years to include bad circuit boards, failure of the backup batteries, and completely shutting down. When the UPS shuts down, the building occupants lose their internet, security systems, and the public do not have access to each division's websites. The DDC controls all of the heating air conditioning in the building. The DDC system will unexpectedly shut down and turn off all of the heating air conditioning within the building. The DDC computer and software have been running 24 seven for over 15 years and are so old they'll no longer support updates and will no longer, uh, they can no longer run on the state security system. Both of the systems are beyond their useful life expectancy and need to be replaced. This project, <clears throat> sorry about that. <clears throat> this project is priority number 25 and proposes the install of a new solar field at the Stewart campus in Carson City. This project will help the state achieve the goal set out in Senate Bill 254 and the governor's executive order to reduce energy consumption. These projects are priority number 26 and 34 and propose the replacement of the water transmission lines. We have been pressing our luck by using these transmission lines for over 70 years. A typical transmission line has a life expectancy of 50 years. This transmission line is leaking in numerous locations. The picture on the left shows a section that is damaged and has a leak band over it. However, it's still leaking. The picture on the right shows a transmission line on the side of the hill that is not structurally sound. Currently, the lines are 18 inches and we're proposing to upsize to a 24 inch. By upsizing the lines, we'll be able to sell more water, and in return, we'll be able to assist the Marlet Lake water system stay solvent. This project is priority number 28, and is to replace the windows at the Icon building. The windows are original, dating back to 1959, and they are not energy efficient. By replacing the windows, it'll help the state achieve the goal set out in Senate Bill 254 and the governor's executive order to reduce energy consumption. 
This project is priority number 29, 30, and 31, and proposes for the HVAC equipment at the Stewart Building 89, 107, and Mill Services Building to be replaced. All of the equipment is beyond its useful life expectancy, is very problematic, and uses R22 refrigerant that has been phased out. Additionally, by changing the HVAC systems, it will help the state achieve the goals set out in Senate Bill 254 and the governor's executive order to reduce energy consumption. This project is priority number 32 and proposes to refurbish the historical fence at the Capitol. The fence was constructed in 1875 and the lights were installed on the corner poles in 1911. In 1980, there was a refurbishment project to include structural, lighting, and paint. Now, in 2020, the fence needs another refurbishment project to include structural as the welds on the fence from 1875 are breaking. Picture on the left shows a fence anchored in sandstone blocks which are cracking and are no longer structurally sound. The electrical will need to be repaired and the fence will need to be painted. Ron, this is Ward. Um, if you could wrap up, wrap up, speed through or do something to speed up, that'd be great. Thank you very much. You, you got it. Absolutely. This project is priority number 34 and will construct two new catchments and will reconstruct the historical timber tunnel on the east slope. The new catchments will be able to collect additional water from the east slope and in return will sell water without having to pump it from our lab. Pumping costs are very costly and the east slope is gravity fed. When collecting the water from the hillside, it has a natural filtration and it's much cleaner than the Marlet Lake water. Excellent. Okay. This project is priority number 36, 37, and 47. It proposes drainage improvements at the Frankie Sue, Attorney General's, and the Stewart Campus. All of the buildings do not have adequate drainage. It is recommended for International Building Code for a 5% slope away from buildings for 10 feet. This project will prevent water infiltration and possible indoor air quality issues. Is that good work? Am I doing okay? Just read, yeah. just read okay. the title. Yeah, just <laughs> read the title. Just read the title. I don't have the titles up here. Okay. Uh, 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 this project is an uh, ADA project on, for the bathrooms on the second floor, and the last remodel was done in 1970. This project is priority number 41. It's to remove and replace the concrete breezeway at the Capitol building. 42, the Martin Lake office. Uh, there's, there's LEDs. Uh, fencing around the site, access gate, asphalt, and electrical. One, thank you. Uh, this is the last one. So this project is priority number 46. I would like to kind of go through this just a little bit real quick. It's 46 and will replace the door hardware of the Capitol building. This will include lock sets, hinges, door closures, levers, kick plates, door stops, and electrical door devices and card readers. This would standardize the door hardware and bring it up to current ADA code. Uh, this door hardware was last replaced in 1977 and is beyond its useful life expectancy. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Is there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Very well done, Ron. Thank you. Are, are, there, are there any questions? Well, Member Hanford, I'm just curious. Are, is there, I assume that, that you've looked at packaging some of this stuff, like the capital or multiple projects. Have you looked at packaging some of that up and seen any? Ward, like Ward Patrick, for the record, that. yes, combining projects, we do get some economies of yeah. scale on that. And, and so, uh, uh, but uh, and so that that will be considered in the future. Yep. Thank you. And Do we have yeah. the Department of Motor Vehicles? Well, great, yes. great job, Ron. Uh, yeah, thank yeah. you, and and everybody from the Department of Administration. I'd like to just uh, highlight the statewide programs. There is no. Uh, there is no uh, PowerPoint for this, but the statewide programs have traditionally been funded. And so I would turn the board's attention to, to page 860. And so what you'll see there is the statewide roofing program. And we've been uh, using a preventive maintenance agreement of 10 years on all of our projects and warranties of 20 years. And these warranties are NDL, no dollar limit warranties. And we rarely execute those, but uh, all of all of that whole package uh, works to pro providing reliable roofing systems. 
and uh, we are considering, because uh, the industry is going this way, to even extending those warranties uh, to 30 years. And so we're looking at, you know, other public entities are doing that and seeing that there's not an extensive cost with that. And so we're just collecting information in our uh, market to see if that'll be a good idea. And so, uh, so these are the requests from all the various agencies that have brought them to your attention. And so you'll note the very top, uh, some of the top, well, somewhere on this list, uh, Endow's very priority one project is on this list. And so we'll be presenting to the board a reduced list uh, in the middle of next month. So this reads some 29 million and, and uh, we'll be working with our project manager to see the highest need projects uh, with the intent of not having buckets in the hallway the primary goal there to keep our buildings dry in all the interims. Uh, the second item here on page uh, 862 is the ADA program and uh, this is the Americans with Dis Disabilities Act program so this has been an ongoing program and uh, so the current request for seven million and this will uh, likely have a recommendation to the board. Also, uh, the Fire and Life Safety Program is on the next page of your book on page 864. And so this is uh, normally considered fire alarms and fire suppression. And so fire suppression could be a dry, a liquid, or uh, some other type of a gaseous uh, fire suppression system. And uh, I point out that once you put a system in a building, you're required to maintain those buildings. And so our project manager, program manager, uh, works to help, you know, all the various uh, state agencies be compliant because we, we have a single expert here and the agencies draw upon that. Uh, the next page is our statewide advanced planning program. And so under consideration here, what this does is allows us $200,000 for contracted support for the CIP planning process for uh, items that come up that we weren't aware of at this time. Some interim needs for to doing some planning and supporting the CIP planning process for the 2023. We're starting to say that now. <laughs> and then also our staff support of this process is a line item in here of approximately 1.5 million. And then you see three uh, items that will be considered to be presented to the board. And so this right now reads $2.4 million as a project cost. And moving to the planning program on the next page, or excuse me, paving program, uh, project 868, page 868. So this is a, a project that uh, um, I'd like to have the chairman present this project, <laughs> being a civil engineer and the paving expertise. No, no, no wait, I'll, I'll do it. So you can see an extensive list here. So there's a lot of needs and uh, the Public Works Division recognizes recognizes uh, preventive maintenance is the key to uh, uh, life cycle cost optimization. And, uh, but there, there's just so many needs in the state that uh, uh, proper preventive maintenance sometimes can't be done because of the, to prevent other emergency needs. But we have a program manager here who uh, has extensive knowledge in this area and goes to continuous continuous training and does a good job with our program. And then the next statewide program on page 870 is the indoor air quality. And so this has to do with uh, uh, lead abatement, mold, and asbestos. And so there's a few projects listed here. And again, that'll be reviewed. And the, the final item here is uh, uh, the uh, statewide building official program. It's $2.2 million. And so we, we're going to uh, move that funding down from state funding on, if you look at the top of page 872, you see a funding summary section right underneath that date of August 14th. And so this uh, is will be agency funded. So. This project has no specific scope at this time, but this is to handle agency money 
and allowing the building official to contract out plans examination and possible uh, contracted inspections. So this is just a, account, it eases the accounting for and the administration of these pieces of work. And I would uh, be available for any questions on the, the statewide programs. Any questions from the board? If not, thank you, uh, everybody in the Department of Administration that made presentations today. You, know, you, you, you didn't have, you didn't give yourself enough time, and you hassled. Me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And uh, I understand we have DMV is going to take us home this afternoon. And they're stay with us. Hi, this is Julie Butler from DMV. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we yes. can. Great. Um, I cannot see my presentation. So. <laughs> Julie, we have it up on the screen here. Uh, if we could get confirmation that some of the board, that the board members that are remote can see it. Uh, uh, you could let us know when to turn the page and if you have it in front of you if that works we could go with that or we could work work it a different way um i can let you know when to turn it that's fine can you see me at all yeah oh no no, no. i thought we could no yeah yeah i'm trying to figure myself out here is your camera on Oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah there you are. Hey. I, I've not used Teams before, so this, this is an inaugural debut here. So, okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm Julie Butler. I'm the director of the Nevada DMV, and I'm here today to present the department's request for advanced design and construction planning for a new full service facility in Las Vegas. With me today is Jude Heron, Deputy Director, Angela Smith Lamb, Administrator of our Administrative Services Division. Gareth Jones, our facilities manager, and Tanya Laney, administrator of our field services division. So, uh, next slide, please. The Donovan Express Commercial Driver's License Facility was built in 1995. As the population of Clark County has grown over time, so has the demand for services. Current federal regulations do not allow for most of the commercial driver's license or CDL services to be conducted online. This means there will always be a need for walk-in counter transactions. The Donovan facility is located in an industrial area of North Las Vegas. The site is awkward to get to by car. It's not a direct shot off the freeway or major road. And the site is routinely vandalized. Customer and state employee safety is a concern as the location is frequented by homeless. Earlier this year, there was a shooting nearby the facility causing the site to be locked down for a period of time. The building is showing its age and all areas require a complete overhaul to the storefront, break rooms, training rooms, public and employee restrooms. The third party program is a federally mandated program which allows a private company or training school to teach and test aspiring commercial drivers. Third party instructors attend and have to pass a 40 hour certification class to qualify for the program. The department received authorization during the 2019 legislative session to add a position to the third party program. The equipment and the furniture for the additional position has made the third party program office, which also doubles as the training room, overcrowded. Because federal regulations mandate all third party participants successfully pass the certification class, having an appropriate space for the staff to administer classroom training is a crucial requirement. Although some classroom training may be available online in the future, there will always be a need for in-person instruction and hands-on skills tests. Next slide, please. The employee break room is original to the building and needs to be remodeled. There are two tables with six chairs at each table. During the summer months, people are eating shoulder to shoulder. This is a pre-COVID number, and today only half of the staff can use the break room due to social distancing requirements. Appliances are old and need to be replaced. There are two unisex restrooms that share a wall with the employee break room. 
This means that employees who are trying to who are excuse me. This means that employees who are trying to enjoy the breaks can hear everything that is going on in the restroom. <laughs> The outside break area consists of two picnic benches adjacent to the employee entrance. With no fencing or other barriers, security is a concern as employees are unable to distance themselves from customers and the homeless. Next slide, please. The Donovan office currently has nine customer service windows and three information desks. Two of the windows serve motor carrier customers. This means that there are really only seven windows available to serve CDL customers. This contributes to longer wait times. Pre-COVID, customer lines routinely extended outside the building. Since COVID, customers line up outside for social distancing. With 100 plus degree temperatures several months out of the year, it makes for a very uncomfortable customer service experience. Next slide, please. The Henderson DMV facility was built in 1997. There are multiple issues with the current facility. Approximately 1,100 to 1,500 people visit the building each day. There are 259 parking spaces, 82 of which are reserved for the 122 staff. So yes, this means that there is not even enough parking on a daily basis for the staff, let alone the customers. There are only nine parking spaces for disabled customers. Customers and staff can often be seen circling the lot several times looking for a space. Often this results in customers being late to their appointments or missing their appointments altogether. Staff members often do not leave the building to enjoy their lunch breaks off-site for fear they will not be able to find parking when they return. If they do leave the building, they must allow themselves the extra time needed to circle the lot and find a space. And when a space is not found, they have to park their cars off-site and walk to the DMV building all within the one hour allotted lunch time. Most have found this impossible. The parking lot cannot be expanded because there is no more available land at that location. The security cameras are old and do not provide quality video footage for investigations. Next slide, please. I'd like to highlight some of the problem areas. The customer counters are not ADA compliant and those with accessibility needs have to be directed to a specific counter. If there are multiple customers with accessibility needs, this can impact wait times for those customers. The counters were installed when less electronic equipment was needed to process customer transactions. However, today's transactions require computers, credit card readers, document scanners, and printers. This limits employee and customer workspace. There are power and data outlet shortages under the counters due to the needed electronic equipment, and power strips are used in abundance. The customer lobby is long, dark, and narrow. Customers often have to cross over one another several times per visit which can cause tempers to flare. The lobby and the exterior entrance flooring is failing and creates a tripping hazard in certain locations. Next slide, please. To meet customer demand, staff have constructed makeshift counters out of spare desks and tables. Some supervisor offices have no ceilings and do not provide a space for confidential conversations with staff. Supervisors must use another person's office or conference room to hold sensitive conversations. The employee restroom facilities consist of one woman's restroom with six stalls and a men's restroom with two stalls and one urinal. These facilities are inadequate to meet the needs of the staff. I'm sure you get the picture. The employee break room can accommodate no more than 12 staff at one time. This is a pre-COVID number and to me only half, half of that number can use the break room due to social distancing. The appliances are old and the electrical outlets need rewiring as there are constant circuit breakers. <coughs> Coupling this challenge with the lack of adequate parking space, staff at the DMV Henderson facility are left with very little accommodations to enjoy the breaks. The outside staff break area has an open fenced patio that resembles a cage in the zoo. Customers can and do walk past employees in the outside break area and ask DMV related questions. This means that DMV staff cannot get away from customers to truly enjoy their hard earned breaks. Some customers have tried to gain access to the building through the outside break area, which poses a security risk. Next slide, please. The Henderson office currently has 38 customer service windows with an average wait time of 54 minutes. The inability to swiftly serve this customer base is not only seen in the long lines and wait times at the Henderson office, but is also seen increasingly in the large number of Las Vegas customers that are traveling to our offices in Mesquite, Perum, and Laughlin to conduct their business. 
This in turn creates longer lines and wait times for the customers at these rural locations. The continuing negative impact to our customer base is only going to worsen given the projected growth rates of Clark County's population over the next 20 years. Next slide, please. The UNLV Center for Business and Economic Research provided the following growth statistics. Clark County's population when the Henderson DMV opened in 1997 was 1.1 million. The projected population of Clark County by 2030 is supposed to be 2.7 million or an increase of 145% from 1997. And in 2040, the projection is nearly 2.9 million, a seven, another 7% 7 increase between 2030 and 2040. In short, it's time for a new facility. And if we can advance uh, two slides so that the header at the top should say Southern Nevada Services Center. Combining the current DMV facilities at Henderson and the Donovan Commercial Driver's License Office in North Las Vegas into one comprehensive service center in South Las Vegas aligns with the administration's priority of putting families first. A one-stop facility designed with DMV's customer service needs in mind will help Nevadans get in and out and on with their lives instead of waiting in line at the DMV. Next slide, please. We envision the design of this facility will be similar to the South Reno facility currently slated for opening later this fall. Design cost savings may be had as specifications are mostly known from the Sahara building and from the Reno projects. Next slide, please. There is a 20-acre uh, parcel of property that is being leased um, through state lands from the Bureau of Land Management that will house this project. Advanced planning and schematic design has already been, con uh, get been completed by Tater Snyder Kimsey, and construction design is the ask for this request. The plan was approved as part of CIP uh, 2011. It is not a general fund project, and the location is not in a residential zone, and it is easily accessible via Interstate 15. Next slide, please. The new Southern Nevada Service Center will alleviate the previous parking issues by providing approximately 350 parking spaces for customers, 143 spaces for employees, and 23 spaces designed for disabled customers. In other words, the facility will accommodate the staff that we have today with room for future growth. Next slide, please. Moving forward with the new South Las Vegas Service Center will increase the capacity of customer service windows at this location from 38 to 49, allowing our customer wait times to be significantly reduced. Our Las Vegas customers will directly benefit, as will our rural customers, who will see fewer customers traveling to field offices in other parts of Southern Nevada to conduct their business. And finally, um, I thank you for your attention today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Member hands the record. Do we, do we have any any questions, uh, perhaps from our board members down south? Ward would like to offer some uh, additional context. I think that was fan always fantastic presentations from the Department of Motor Vehicles. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Director Butler. Uh, for context, uh, we're opening the Reno South Reno DMV on November second. So it's currently under construction, and you've seen the uh, site plan that's to be used as a model. And so uh, uh, November 2nd, it's planned to be open, and uh, we were there the other day. It's looking very, very good. I hope you've had a chance to uh, visit that director recently. Very exciting, yep. absolutely. Yep, and so that project, uh, uh, is go going well and completing and then uh, recently the Sahara DMV was completed and both of these projects as was mentioned have a s similar programmatic programmatic need although the Sahara project did not have a CDL course or CDL offices as was pointed out earlier but so uh, you know Sahara was funded in the 15 CIP and the uh, uh, large part of the funding was in the uh, 17 CIP for the South Reno DMV, and so this is a request here in the 19 CIP.
very good. So, so I never had this record. So the, the, the two existing facilities are 25 and 23 years old or something like that. They're not, they're, they're pretty young facilities. Um, that it's not possible to, um, you know, pretty, I'm sure this has been looked at, but this is what it estimated to be about a $60 million project. <coughs> Would it be more efficient to to renovate those properties? I, I understand that there maybe there be there may be some issues with, with the real estate that's available. <laughs> but <clears throat> Ward Patrick, so, if I may help with that, director. Uh, well, I, I wanted to. This is Julie Butler, so I wanted to see from the um, from a business perspective. We we looked at that and looked at rehabbing, but. The, um, the under, it, it won't solve the underlying problems in that the Donovan facility, uh, we've, out, we've outgrown both facilities, A. It won't solve the parking problem at Henderson, and it won't solve uh, the location problem at Donovan, um, and, and that it's awkward to get to. Our commercial drivers uh, have a difficult time right now as it is taking their commercial vehicles to the facility, and, and there's no parking for them. Um, and so really, yeah, could we renovate them? Yes, but it's not going to solve the long term, uh, short term, uh, the growth that, that Clark County has experienced um, in, in the 25 years since these facilities were built. And then long term, you saw the population projections, it's only going to get worse. Um, and, and so really, um, you know, pay for it now or pay for it later. Um, at some point, we're going to pay for it. So that's uh, kind of from a programmatic standpoint. And then Ward can speak um, I, more eloquently, I think, to the um, the structural and, and the other types of needs there. So Ward, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. I wasn't. I think those are fine buildings and can can continue for 20 more years, but maybe for a different purpose. And so uh, Ron Cochran is still online here, and and he's kind of uh, looking forward to adding that to keeping that in his inventory, but adding the new DMV to leased buildings. And so that building would be able to be leased for other services in, uh, in Henderson. And uh, we've been uh, uh, planning to look for other uses as well for the Donovan facility since it has, uh, since the, the, the program has outgrown both the, the uh, site as well as each building. Thank you. Tito and Clint are both like this. There's, is there, is there something on, on the mind? <laughs> Any other questions for Ms. Butler? If not, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for your consideration and time today. So, uh, the next um, item on our agenda is the uh, administrator's report on the agency activity. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Ward Patrick, for the record. We've had a few staffing updates in recent times, and there really has not been uh, too many changes. There have been no changes, and so uh, we uh, move on to major projects. Regarding major projects, um, we're, we're, you've, you've heard during the course of today that uh, the DMV project is planned to open on November 2nd. You heard, you heard that uh, today that the UNR, UNR engineering building was dedicated and students are using it and faculty are using it as of this week and last week. And then also today, the military in Southern Nevada, there's a Speedway Readiness Center that you've heard talk about that. And that's been uh, uh, completed and uh, their uh, federal funding cycle for operations basically opens up October 1. But so the, 
there's a, a few things that are being finished up there, but the uh, the military is taking over the security of the site as opposed to the contractor. Okay. Then there's two other major projects that are under construction, which is the education building at Nevada State College. Make sure I get that right. And so that project is uh, proceeding and is expected to be uh, complete, completed or nearing completion in April. And so we're approximately 50% complete with that project. And the, the same basically goes for the uh, College of Southern Nevada project. Both of these were, were all, these were also, I think, discussed today by the various uh, campuses. And so uh, that project is 56%, uh, 50 or so percent complete as well and is, is going for plan. And uh, they're actually doing interior painting on that project and they have till uh, April to complete and those projects are going well. That completes my uh, report for major projects and agency activities. Thank you, Morgan. Anybody have any questions? Or on this update. Sean, sir, for the record, I would just note that Ward's comments were much shorter than Gus's work times. <laughs> <laughs> we can always elaborate more. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We could, but we won't. <laughs> well, then we'll, uh, we'll move on to agenda item 13 for possible action, which is a uh, board comment and discussion. Um, I think this is around uh, uh, agendas and future meetings. Ward, do you want to do this one? Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, but, but I think kind of the first bullet here is just open ended. If the board has any comments for any uh, future agenda, for any future meetings, um, so. Uh, I know that we've, uh, we're working with the subcommittee on bidder qualification, and so uh, we chose not to bring any detail here on that, but so that will be coming for a future meeting. And then also, um, we're going to be having these CIP meetings. We also talked about having a, a little dialogue in the future on deferred maintenance. And so that's been um, ongoing and we'll pick that up again uh, once the CIP process is a little bit behind us. And so I'm, uh, I would then uh, open it up to any other uh, future agenda items. Those are already on our radar. And if there are any others, we could um, have a discussion and add that to the list. I had a question, if that's okay. Uh, Susan Stewart, for the record. Uh, Ward, uh, I was going to ask the board and you, um, September 16 is a date we have set aside for your recommendation to the board on the CIP. And I wondered if you were and the board as well were open to adding the subcommittee's recommendations to that agenda um, or if you wanted to just have that meeting be dedicated to the administrator's recommendations. 